I never wanted to go on that stupid hike in the first place. Yet there I was, allegedly enjoying nature and getting healthy exercise while hiking from cabin to cabin in the Norwegian mountains with the devil spawn otherwise known as my class. Woohoo, right? For a misanthropic misfit like myself, it was a nightmare. Within half an hour of walking on the uneven path over the heather, I was at the back of the group. Hey man, how's it going there? Niels the teacher asked in a cheery tone. Fucking amazing, I growled. In spite of the cool wind, sweat was beating on my forehead and my breath was growing short. I glared at Peter and John, who were bouncing along at the front of the group. Of course, the most popular guys in my class would also be the best hikers. Assholes. So, Anders, do you go hiking often? Do I go hiking often, I said. Look at me, teach. Do I look like I fucking go hiking often? I gestured to my pudgy body, glaring at him. Clearly flustered, he changed the topic. Then what do you like to do? Computer stuff, I answered curtly. So is this temporary, or are you going to try to make awkward small talk the whole time? Uh, I didn't think it was awkward. Blessed silence followed. Peter and John were out of sight, damn soccer players and their mutant lungs, and I took the opportunity to take in the scenery. Misshapen warped birch trees were scattered over the alternating yellowing grass and purple heather, the occasional huckleberry peeking out. Mountains cascaded towards the sky on both sides, towering over us. It was quite breathtaking. Now that the devil spawn was out of sight and lame-ass Nils had shut up, I found myself almost enjoying it. In fact, I realized the whole experience would have been quite pleasant if all those fuckers would just go ahead and die. I kicked at a rock and tripped. Hey there, be careful, buddy, Niels said, grabbing my arm. Don't want to go and get injured on the first day, do we now? I sent him a death glare, and we kept walking in silence. By the end of the third day, I was not just at the rear, but pretty much in a whole other hiking party than the rest of my class. My body ached from the strain, and Niels had long ago abandoned any attempt at small talk. When the last cabin was finally within eyeshot, the sun had disappeared behind the mountains, and we were hiking by that gloomy blue half-light that lingers after the northern sunsets. The cabin loomed in the distance. What we called a cabin was really a set of small red cabins, an empty campground, and a rather large main house. It could easily house a hundred people, probably way more with the campground open. It looked out of place there in the middle of the bare mountains. I was completely exhausted when I finally managed to drag my fat ass to the front door of the main house. As I pulled it open, I was immediately hit in the face with the laughter shouting, and all the other sounds of general youthful tomfoolery. Damn devil spawn. A sour feeling spread through my guts. I was missing out on all of this. I had no idea how to socialize with these people. God, I wish they'd all just die. Maybe then I'd get some peace and quiet. So, Anders, it seems the rest already finished dinner. I guess it's just you and me now. I groaned at the prospect. To add insult to injury, the dining room was on the other side of the common room. Not only did I have to endure the shame of being last and of eating with the teacher, but I'd also have to do the walk of shame in front of all of them. I looked down at the linoleum floor, face burning like a brand as I endured the laughter of my peers. They were clever enough to not directly mock me, not directly laugh at me, but I knew what they were thinking. Niels and I sat down at one of the long tables in the empty dining room, and I stuffed myself full of the cold pasta as he chatted easily. A friend of his ran this place. It was technically closed for the season, but he had gotten us in here as a favor. That's why there weren't any staff around. They dropped off food earlier that day, and now we had the whole place to ourselves. So there we were, thirty kids, two teachers, and the vast empty space that stretched between the mountains. Eerie when you think about it, right? He said, winking. It was. I got up from the table as soon as I could with every intention of going straight to bed. I took a deep breath to steady my nerves enough to walk through the common room again. Laughter rang through the door, filling the dining room, taunting me with happiness and camaraderie I was sure I'd never experience. I opened the door and felt their eyes on me as I shuffled through the room. You can't even look at us, they mocked. You can't even keep up on a hike. Fat loser, go home. We don't want you here. Nobody actually said anything out loud, but I knew they were thinking it.
I walked quickly to the room I was sharing with Peter, John, and another kid. The assholes had left me a bottom bunk, like they were such nice people. Probably too scared to sleep below fatty, I thought bitterly, glaring at the pine bunk. They'd probably laughed about it, too. I wanted to be in bed, asleep, or believably pretending to be when they got here. They didn't need to see my pudgy, pale tummy or smell the sweat that had permeated all my clothes. And anyway, the place was completely outside cell range. Without my trusty internet, I had little to live for, let alone to stay awake for. I curled up under the duvet and the exhaustion drowned out my usual self-deprecating internal monologue. I was asleep in minutes. I woke up in a panic in the middle of the night. The room was pitch black, and I just knew someone was standing over my bed looking at me. My heart was pounding in my throat as I lay there for what felt like hours. Nothing happened. Of course nothing happened, I tried to tell myself. I was being silly. I was safe. There was nothing but miles and miles of empty woods around here where anything could be hiding. Could have followed us, could have seen us, defenseless alone. No, you're safe, don't be silly. How the hell had they made the room this dark? Where was the crack in the curtain, the red lamp on an appliance? I wanted to turn on the light, to see what was there. But I didn't want to wake up the others. Guess I was more scared of their taunting eyes than I was of the crazy axe murderer that definitely was in the room. As a sort of compromise, I decided to go to the bathroom. I sat up, swung my legs off the side of the bed and felt around for my shoes. I snuck out the door and flicked the switch in the hallway and glanced back into the room. Nothing there, of course. I just had to make sure. I padded down the hallway, the ugly red wall-to-wall -wall carpet muffling the sounds of my steps. I shuddered as I opened the bathroom door. It was freezing. Some idiot had left the window open. I did my business and shuffled over to the window to close it while rubbing my arms with my hands. I stretched out an arm to grab the handle and froze. I had caught a glimpse of the night sky and I had seen... It couldn't be, not this far south, right? It could be, of course, but really? That light green light spreading across the starry sky. It was the first time I saw them, the northern lights. Exhilarated, I bounced down the hallway and snuck into the dark room. I grabbed a coat and my phone and was halfway out the door before I thought to wake up the others. I was sure they'd love to see the lights as much as I would. Screw them. Not like they'd wake me up if the tables were turned. The grass crunched as I walked across it, the frost that now covered the ground glittering in the strange green light from the sky. A green blob stretched across the darkness, flickering slightly as if there was a strong wind up there. The lights weren't particularly strong or defined, but undeniable. I don't know anything else that can turn the night sky green like that. The fear I had felt when I woke up had drained from my body, and I was mesmerized by the pure beauty of the natural show. I stood there for hours, not moving until my whole body started shaking violently, and I realized I was in danger of hypothermia. Reluctant, I shuffled back inside. My eyes had adjusted to the darkness outside, so I snuck down the hallway without turning the lights on. I didn't want the grim, fluorescent light burn out the beautiful memory of the aurora. The little light on my phone was enough to identify my room. I paused outside the door, sighing, and quickly slipped inside. I curled up under the warm duvet and quickly fell asleep. I woke up, stretched my arms over my head and yawned loudly. I groped around on the floor for my phone and closed one eye as the bright screen blinded me. 10.37. Immediately I was wide awake. Shit, 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 breakfast at 7.30, hiking by 8.30? Why the hell had nobody woken me up? I jumped out of bed, almost hitting my head on the bunk above me in the darkness. The blinds were down, the room dark. I flipped the switch on the wall, but nothing happened. I groped around for my clothes, getting my head stuck in the sleeve of my sweater in the rush. I opened the door. The corridor was dark, too, the place dead quiet. A chill ran down my spine. Had they left me behind? As a prank? No, Niels would never have agreed to that. Would he? I pictured his flustered face as I shut down his every attempt at small talk. Maybe he would. A slow burn of worry started in my gut as I thought of the miles and miles of empty wilderness surrounding me. All that empty space, the long, lonely road. The road. Yes, yeah, someone would have to come to get me. I wouldn't have to hike anymore. Maybe this was all for the best. Or maybe they had just canceled the hike and all the kids were in the dining room now. 
I set off to find people or food, preferably both. The common room and the dining room were both empty. They looked so much bigger today, when it was only me in them. Breakfast was clearly over, but I was hungry. I crossed my fingers that I'd find some leftovers in the kitchen. I pushed open the door with the staff-only sign, shuffled across the linoleum floor, and opened the fridge. A big smile spread across my face as I took in the sight in front of me. Is there anything more beautiful than a fully stocked fridge? I made myself a sandwich and munched on it while trying to decide what to do next. When I went to make the second one, I realized that there really was too much food left over. This was enough food to feed thirty kids and then some. Hadn't anyone else eaten? The uneasy feeling came back. Why would they have left without food? Had something happened? Again, the image of the vast heather, the lonely road, the cabin that looked like it had been copy-pasted into the wilderness. Anything could be hiding out there, in the mountains, in the rooms. Oh, God, the rooms. There were so many empty rooms, empty cabins, closed doors, closed doors with God knows what behind them. I should have checked the rooms. Why hadn't that been my first move? Panic spread again, and I knew I had to do something before I was completely paralyzed by it. I took a deep breath, got to my feet, and left the kitchen. My footsteps rang through the cavernous dining room. My heart was pounding in my throat when I snuck down the long hallway, past door after door, the only light what seeped in from the window at the far end. The gloomy sky outside did little to provide light and less to assuage my fears. I stopped in front of my room. It felt like a safe place to start. I pushed the handle and the door slid open without a sound. The blinds kept the room completely dark. I crossed the room in two long strides and groped around for the string. I tugged at it and jumped slightly as the sound of the curtain rolling up rang through the room. I turned around and to my great surprise found Peter sleeping peacefully in his bed. Relief flooded through me. I wasn't alone. Peter, I croaked. I cleared my throat. Peter, I repeated a little louder. No response. I stared at him, wondering why he was still there. It made no sense. And he looked oddly. Still. I took a step toward him. Peter, I whispered, heart pounding in my throat. I reached out, grabbed his arm under the covers, and shook. No response. He seemed totally dead. The thought hit me like a ton of bricks. Dead? No, no way. Absolutely not. I forced my shaking hand towards his neck for a pulse. My fingertips made contact with his icy skin, and I knew. He must have been dead for hours. My knees buckled under me, and I crashed to the floor. Peter was dead. He was just lying there. He had been lying there for hours. Right next to me, and I had walked in and out of the room. I had eaten breakfast. I had slept there, right next to his corpse. Oh, God. I vomited. I scrambled to my feet. I needed to get out of the tomb. I steadied myself on the upper bunk and jumped back in shock when I saw John just as still as Peter in his bunk. I stretched a shaking arm out. I had to make sure. I shuddered as my fingers met his skin. He was as cold and dead as Peter. Slowly I turned around. I screamed as I looked right into Jacob's open eyes. His dead, cold stare burrowed into me, and I backed away. I hit the bunk behind me, and the force made John's arm fall over the edge. It hung there, swinging. I couldn't take my eyes off the arm as I backed out into the corridor. I slammed the door shut and continued my desperate retreat until I slammed against the opposite door. My knees grew weak again, and I slid down the door. My arm connected with the handle and the door swung open behind me. I staggered backward, overbalanced, and fell, hard on my back. The fall knocked the air out of me, making me gasp for breath. I spotted an arm out of the corner of my eye, and still trying to swallow air, I turned my head. Lisa, beautiful, blonde. Lisa lay there, not moving. I poked her arm. It swung in the air just like Jacob's had, and I stared at it, hypnotized. Slowly, I turned my head. The girl in the other bottom bunk had rolled up against the wall. I steadied myself with my arm and pushed myself up. On my feet I saw two more bunks, two more corpses. I stumbled back into the hallway, looked side to side, and froze. So many doors. I only remember bits and pieces from what happened next. My complete panic turned it all into a blur. Running wildly down the hallway, pushing desperately at locked doors, slamming the doors that opened closed after revealing another tomb, I didn't find anyone alive. 
Finally, I collapsed in a heap outside Niels's room. My throat was aching from the screaming or the vomiting. I couldn't say which. Tears were rolling down my face, my body shaking convulsively. I curled up in a little ball, face on the rough carpet, sobbing like a baby. Eventually, the part of my brain that was still running some sort of script managed to take over. Can't stay here. I peeled myself off the floor and sat up, leaning against the door. I should probably get out of here, I thought, in a detached manner. I wasn't afraid anymore. I didn't feel anything. After all, if I were in danger, I'd be dead already. I should call the police. I pulled my phone out of my pocket. It had 20% battery and no signal. I pushed myself to my feet, leaning my back against the door. I needed to find a high point. But would the battery last? I scrunched my eyes up, took a deep breath, and walked back into Niels's room. His phone was right there, next to the bed. I picked it up, pressed the button on the side, and watched it as nothing happened. I held the button for ten seconds before I released it. Still nothing. The phone was as dead as everyone else. I forced myself to go into the next room. Christian, Thomas, Christopher, Lars. Three phones lay on the little table by the window, all plugged into their chargers. First phone? Dead. Second phone? I sent a little prayer to a god I had never believed in as I pressed the button as hard as I could. Dead. Third phone? Nothing. I threw it angrily at the wall, making a satisfyingly loud bang as it hit the wooden panel. Gotta start hiking and praying then. When I pushed open the front doors it felt like I was emerging from a grave. I took a deep breath and started walking towards the hill behind the cabin at a fresh pace. A path revealed itself and I marched resolutely along it. It twisted up the hill and would, it had to, lead me to a signal. At first I checked the phone every five meters, but as the battery level fell, I forced myself to wait longer and longer. The path twisted between small pine trees back and forth across the hill. My face burned with exhaustion and frustration. Every time I checked the phone, the battery was a little bit lower. At 15%, the phone sent an angry message. Do you want to turn on battery saving? Fuck yes. 11%, 8%, 5%, and the screen dimmed the lights. A raindrop fell on the screen, or was it sweat? 4%, 3%, 2%. A single bar blinked, and I shrieked. With shaking hands, I pressed 112 and waited, praying. Police, what's your... No battery! Need police at the... Goddamn, the redacted cabin! They're dead! They're all dead! I need help, please! The line went oddly quiet, and I lowered my hand to see a black screen. I hovered my thumb over the power button for a moment before I pressed it. That stupid opening graphic flashed across the screen. I frantically typed in my pin, pressed the phone icon, and watched in disbelief as the screen turned black again. I stared at it until the cold wind made me shudder. I was soaked with sweat, exhausted, and freezing. Only then did it occur to me to wonder why they were dead. You'd think that would be the first thing on my mind, but it wasn't. But up there, on the narrow path between the dark fir trees, my last avenue of communication gone, did I ask the question, What happened? Serial killer? No, why would I be alive? Poisoned food? Again, why would I be alive? They looked like they had died peacefully in their sleep. Airborne poison? Carbon monoxide? That made sense. You hear these horror stories? Busted heater? Family dead? Why not school class? and I had spent hours outside in the fresh air last night. I turned around. In front of me, a gap in the pine trees revealed a perfect view of the field and the cabin below, shattering my rational explanation. Because down there, in the heather and fields that surrounded the huts, was a perfect circle of brown dead heather and grass. The main building sat at the edge. The spot where I had been standing last night was right outside it. The police were there when I got back down. Later the deaths were ruled accidental carbon monoxide poisoning. I was told to let it go when I asked about the circle. And the northern lights? They hadn't been visible anywhere over mainland Norway for weeks. There's three of them outside. Hikers, probably. Older maps usually show a route over the motorway behind my house, but there isn't one anymore. I don't mind them usually, they just walk down and then walk back up a few minutes later and I go and explain the situation to them. 
I saw these three early, so I hoped I could go out and talk to them before they walked down, save them the trip. They looked like a family, one man walking a little bit in front of two women, one just a teenager. The girls were looking at a map while he strode ahead confident. It was late evening, the sun just barely falling behind the hill. Summer nights like this means the night comes late. I saw them from my window and walked around to my front door quickly. I put my hand on the handle and glanced outside through the glass. Then I stopped. I stopped, because so had they. For a moment I thought they had just stopped walking to check the map or something, but just the glimpse sent a chill through me, like something was just barely off. Uncanny valley, right? I looked at them a little closer and saw that they had not just stopped, they had stopped mid-step. The one at the front had their front leg raised in the air and the other two were weirdly balanced forward, a position that would be difficult to maintain. I assumed they had seen me and were doing some sort of performance, like those street performers that look like statues and maintain poses. Then I spotted it, the thing that had made my skin prickle. Their map was stuck. It was somewhere between the adult woman's hand and the floor, mid-air. It was not touching anything that I could see and was completely still despite the strong breeze. My mind raced through the options. Wires wouldn't explain how it was so still. Maybe it was actually solid and only looked like thin paper. Either way, I let go of the handle. If they really were performers, no harm in staying inside and leaving them there. I had neighbors, so even if there was a problem, then other people would be aware of it. I rationalized it to myself and turned away, unable to get rid of the throbbing cold in my stomach. I walked into my kitchen, made a mug of tea and sipped it, trying to warm myself despite my already perfectly heated house. I couldn't help myself. I walked over to the window. They were still there, hadn't moved an inch, but I was closer now. Looking back, I wish my window had been further away. I wish it was thicker and soundproofed, but it wasn't, so I could hear them. The walkers were talking. I could see it now, their mouths moving just a little to communicate enough. It was hard to make out words, but the mother and father were talking in an attempt at a calm tone to their daughter. She was sobbing. I felt a pang of sympathy, shame for ignoring them, and a rush of fear. I had ignored how wrong this felt before, but this was too much. I desperately wanted to go help them, to hug the daughter and tell her was okay. But I couldn't. I couldn't go outside. Then it would happen to me. I'm not sure why, but I had the overwhelming feeling that the exact same thing would happen to me. It was getting even harder to see them. They had stopped moving as the sun set, and now they were only barely visible from the lights in my house. I remembered my neighbors and looked down the street. I could see Maureen next door. She was looking out the window like I was. I tried to get her attention, but she was looking at the hikers. I usually avoided calling her. She was nice, but always had some new drama going on. She's just old and bored, so she tends to talk a lot, but we've been vague, neighborly friends for a few years. However, I quickly picked up my phone and dialed her number. I saw her turn and walk out of sight before picking up. Hello? Hi, Maureen. It's just me. Patrick, are you at home right now? Do you see those people outside my house? They've been standing out there for hours. It had only been minutes, an exaggerator as always. Yeah, I see them. Please don't go outside. I wasn't planning to. Bloody travelers would probably beat up an old woman. I think they're just hikers. No need to be worried. I think they are just... I couldn't think of a good reason for why they were acting like that, but wanted to assuage her fears. Well, let's just try and figure out what they're doing and if they need help. Just don't go outside, okay? I heard you the first time. You don't need to worry about me, Patrick. I'm going to call Albert to see if anyone further down the street saw where they came from. Okay, thanks, Maureen. Talk to you in a bit. Bye, dear. Click. I looked back out at them, almost impossible to see now. It was only because I knew they were there that I could even make out their shapes, and I could still hear them. They were louder now. I could make out a couple words, then just one, over and over. Help. I suddenly cursed, living alone, wishing I could at least talk to someone. Maybe if there were houses on the other side of the street, I could at least communicate with the person across the street from me. But it was just open fields. I used to like that view. I looked down the street again. 
and again my spine felt like it was crawling out of my body. Maybe I have some sort of ability to spot things that were out of place in just a glance, but something else was wrong. The lights from the houses were out. The only lights that were on were the three closest houses on the right. I looked the other way and they were all on, all the way down the street. That's how it usually was until much later in the night. I looked back and tried to see details in the blacked-out houses, probably a power cut. But why was it just those ones? Weren't we all on the same grid? Then a flash. The furthest house's lights just went out, all of them at the same time like a fuse had blown. I frantically reached for the phone and tried to call Maureen again, damning myself for not knowing the numbers of any of the further neighbors. It cut straight to an automated voice. The line was in use. I hung up and started pacing, looking out at the two remaining lit houses and glancing at the hikers outside. I couldn't see them, but I knew they were there. The voices were quieter, but they were talking still. Could they see me? I had no way of knowing. It was too late now. I should have tried to talk to them earlier. I let out a shriek as my phone burst into life. It was Maureen. Maureen, is that you? Are you okay? No need to shout. I'm fine. A sigh of relief. Cut short as the corner of my vision flashed. The next house had gone dark. It was only Maureen's house lit on the right side. Did you talk to Albert? I tried to keep my voice level. I didn't want to panic her. Maybe it was just a power cut. He picked up but then started talking nonsense. He said his arthritis was acting up worse than usual. He couldn't move. Something about a power cut. He wanted me to call an ambulance, but you know how Albert is. Hypochondriac. I think we should go check on him and... Her lights went out. Maureen? Maureen? Are you still there? I could hear her breathing. Patrick, something's wrong. I can't turn around. It's okay, Maureen. Just a power cut. You're just scared. There's something scratching. What? My voice sounded like a child who just heard the monster under their bed talk. On my door. That? That's just your cat. The door is open. Then she screamed. I pulled the receiver away from my ear as the loud, piercing shriek filled the air. I could hear it from the phone and from the house directly. Maureen? I sounded distant from myself. Click. I'm not sure if I hung up or she did. I looked out my window trying to see the hikers. They were quiet now. They probably heard it too. I felt like I was in a daze. I stumbled over to my sofa and sat stiffly. My laptop was open next to me, half-finished work on the glowing screen. I deleted it and started typing. I'm not sure why. No one saw this coming. Maybe I could warn someone. I typed frantically, fingers moving faster than in all the work I had ever done. Then a flash, and my lights went out. The only light was the glow of the screen. My fingers could still move, but I couldn't stand up. I could talk. I know because I screamed. I dare not make any sound now. My laptop is still plugged in and getting power. This isn't a power cut. I haven't heard the hikers since the scream. I hope they're okay. The only thing I can hear is the clicking of the keys and the scratching at my door. A few days ago, I uprooted my entire existence and relocated to the southwest cape of Stewart Island, New Zealand. Initially, I had intended this trip as an escape, to be shared with my wife as we lived out the rest of our days in beach-dwelling bliss. Yet as we aged, I began fostering a general disdain for the direction that society seemed to have chosen for itself. I simply grew weary of the unceasing, perpetually fruitless debates over issues like race, homosexuality, political agendas, abortion, and the like. As far as I was concerned, people could do as they wished, as long as they weren't harming anyone else, simple-minded and a bit naive, perhaps, but my stance nonetheless. With my frustration mounting, my wife and I began planning the move in our late thirties, hopefully with two full decades ahead of us to get our affairs properly aligned to allow for such an exodus. But the train derailed as I reached 43, and she was diagnosed with an untreatable brain tumor. Two years later I was alone and wanted nothing more than to expedite my exit from mainstream civilization. I sold our house and our cars, the latter being more painful as I prized my 69 Stingray convertible. Nonetheless, the profit from its sale was necessary to procure adequate funding for my relocation, disappearing is no cheap venture and it brought me an odd sense of closure in regards to that chapter of my life. The crippling depression from the loss of my wife remained, but I felt little remorse for the loss of our lifestyle. 
The outdoors had always been a passion of mine since my earliest memory. Fishing, kayaking, game hunting, cross-country hiking, and anything else without a ceiling over it had always been my forte. My spirit yearned for a climate requiring a survivalist mentality, and I had every intention of spending the rest of my days in just such an environment. Thus my research led me to Stewart Island, the southernmost portion of New Zealand. The mild climate, sparse population, immediate access to open water, and dense forestry completed my checklist. The prospect of dangerous wildlife or poisonous vegetation brought me no qualms. After all, there aren't even any terrain-dwelling snakes on the island. What few locals were present on Stewart Island were nice enough upon my arrival, having harbored a few tourists here and there for the more accessible beaches. I did draw a few laughs from the older residents when I told them where I planned to go, and encountered one old man that simply shook his head and walked away when I mentioned the Southwest Cape's eastern shore. But I could not be discouraged. There was no turning back. My final stop was at the local supply depot in Oban. There I purchased a map, two books on native flora and fauna, a leather-bound journal, ink, a canteen, an axe with a 36-inch handle, a hunting knife, 30 feet of braided paracord, a small fishing kit, waterproof matches, a compass, and a Swiss gear pack to place it all in. I told myself that if I had forgotten anything I didn't need it, or would be able to construct it for myself. Either way, I would either make do or die, and although I wouldn't describe myself at the time as suicidal, death didn't seem such a horrible alternative. The hike to the Southwest Cape took me almost three days, the journey made longer because of the mud from recent rains. Sleep was difficult the first night, as it had been some time since I had slept on the ground, and the reality of my endeavor finally began to sink in. While experienced within the natural world, slight anxiety came over me upon the realization that I may have bitten off more than I could chew, and I had no fallback option. Juxtaposed with this thought was a comfort in knowing that my newfound worry indicated a resurgence in my will to live. Eventually, my psyche balanced these two notions, and I did manage to sleep a few hours, awaking with renewed confidence in the face of the rising sun. Days two and three were largely uneventful, save for a brief but violent thunderstorm and a confrontational encounter with what may have been a brush-tail possum. Despite the critter's sincere efforts, I found myself on the coastline midday of the third. Authentic peril would not rear its head until that evening. My efforts in constructing camp that day concluded with the completion of a water collection basin that I devised from several broad ferns and a species of bamboo that I knew had been introduced to the area centuries before. Previously, I had created a small hut of the same bamboo and ferns to serve as my shelter, until I ventured to build something more ambitious, along with a moderate fire and a few limb lines for fishing. Resigning myself to relaxation for the remainder of the day, I took off my clothes and my boots and braved the somewhat murky but refreshing surf. Initially I was met with intrigue in regards to the gradient at which the water deepened. Approximately 100 meters from shore I found myself only knee-deep, and I could feel the soft white sands beneath my soles. In hindsight, perhaps the lack of aquatic life in the area should have been an indicator of something amiss but I was still planted firmly in the euphoria of my self-engineered renaissance. I stood for perhaps another thirty seconds merely observing my surroundings and then took a step forward. From there, I cannot convey the alarm that I experienced when I was suddenly and completely submerged. I am ashamed to say that my instinctual reaction was panic. I had not seen any darkening of the water to indicate such a drastic depth change, and yet there I was. I kicked frantically for the surface and found it soon enough, gasping for breath. As I regained my composure, I cursed my neglect for not bringing goggles or a snorkel, for who knew what sort of wonder-laden reef I may have stumbled upon. Regardless, my decision to resubmerge was met by terror surpassed only by events that would occur later. I exhaled just enough oxygen to go under and stabilize at approximately three meters. I thought that maybe the water somehow became more buoyant at this point, but disregarded the feeling as my imagination. I decided to open my eyes despite the salinized water. I peered down, deep below me, in a black, abysmal hole that can only be described as a void, were a pair of whitewashed eyes, 
visible only because of their apparent uncanny ability to reflect such finite amounts of light. The pupils were entirely black, with no rings of color, and appeared to be transfixed upon me. I was stricken with fright, yet unable to save myself from my impending doom. Entranced, I continued to stare downward, waiting for the appearance of some gaping hole of a mouth to inhale me into the terrible unknown of its insides. But the moment never came. I received, whether it was from some sort of telepathy or my own intuition, the distinct feeling that this mammoth creature wished to harm me in ways that man had never known, but something was holding it back. I could not fathom what could possibly be restraining the beast, its size surely rivaling that of a submarine or battleship. My chest burning for air brought me back from my fearful marveling, and I tried desperately to swim to the surface, yet I still could not move. I remember only the taste of salt and stagnant water as I drifted into merciful unconsciousness, a strange pang of relief echoing in my thoughts. I awoke on the beach on what seemed to be the next morning, face up with a strand of kelp around my midsection and a feeling not unlike a hangover. I jolted upward, aggravating my headache, but deeming it more important to scan the water for the creature. I spied nothing but the crashing waves and scattered fragments of driftwood. I collapsed back onto the sand and gazed into the overcast sky, edging on delirium, and only capable of thinking of the eyes. Oh, God, the eyes! After an eternity of contemplation, I found the motivation to rise and attempt to carry on. I could find no rational explanation short of some strange hallucination, but could recall nothing that would have caused it. Throughout the day, my intellect continued to pull me towards the multitudes of legends and unsolved mysteries of the unexplored sea. Unknown sounds captured on tape, megalodon sharks, Jules Verne novels, the Bermuda Triangle, and others similar. Nothing I could fathom satisfied me, and I despaired with no discernible reason as to why I did not abandon my supposed slice of paradise, and a dull anxiety that persisted for the remainder of the day. I cut my fishing lines, simultaneously knowing that they would yield nothing while also fearing what may be present at their ends. It was then that I realized I had witnessed not a single marine life form. My fire had smoldered to ashes, so I replenished it, gathering driftwood from the beach and dried foliage from the tree line, all the while keeping a wary eye on the water, awaiting the appalling eyes that resided below the surface. On that day they made no appearance. There should be no surprise that I did not sleep well that night, having exhausted my wildlife manual and illuminating no form of insect or animal otherwise that could have induced my experience. By morning, however, my distress began to dissipate, as my mind exhausted itself and simply relegated its time to other things, food, for example. At some point after dawn I made the decision to hike somewhat inland and try my hand at trapping, as fishing seemed foolish and I felt the need to get away from the shore for a time. I endeavored to create six traps, all sling rigs camouflaged with the litter of the forest. It was during my search for an animal sign that I discovered the Emma. The schooner, with its name etched in fading stain on its stern, was approximately five hundred meters inland, lying capsized on its deck, with several varieties of vine and runners growing around the masts, which had been forced through the bottom of the hull and stood erect as if the ship had been dropped on its top from a great height. The hull itself was perhaps twenty meters, large enough for a dozen crew members at the most. Curiously enough, there were immense circular patterns etched into the ship's surface, as if a gargantuan placostomus had scraped a meal of algae from the vessel while it was still afloat. Summarily, I decided that I could adapt and renovate the craft into my permanent residence, its location away from the waterline suddenly appealing. I finished setting my traps at a distance and began my new project immediately. The labor was invigorating. I was so excited about my fortune in finding the Emma that I nearly forgot about my encounter, thinking of it only occasionally and partially settling on dehydration as a likely culprit. Using my axe, I cut an entry to the hull and began clearing what little sun-starved growth there was, along with eradicating any unwanted inhabitants. I battled briefly with the notion that I might find human remains or even lost treasures, but discovered neither. My only finding was an old leather volume coming apart at the spine. It was apparent that the tome had been either sunken or rained on, as indicated by the illegible remains of water-diluted ink on the pages. 
The only decipherable items were two in number, a single date, March 21, 1925, and the phrase, It Calls Me, near the bottom of the last used page. I presumed at the time it was a sailor referring to the call of their personified ocean. Finally satisfied with the day's accomplishments, I checked my traps, another brushtail possum and something resembling a kiwi, and trudged back to the shoreline campsite. I had actually managed to wholly put the day before out of mind until I looked to the eastern horizon. In the sun's late glow, I stared yet again at it, this time with its eyes and a portion of its massive head breaching the surface. The eyes maintained their washed-out quality, despite reflecting the incoming sunset, and now with some reference, I could see the thing was much larger than I had originally estimated. Its scalp appeared cephalopodin in nature, with a wet olive-green hue and likely a layer of some sort of plasmatic coating. Just beneath the water's now churning surface I could distinguish at least eight serpentine masses, seeming to extend from the head, writhing together with some form of lateral undulation. As before, I could not move. Sometime during this I fell to my knees, not out of dumbfounded dread but some instinctual need to kneel, as if before royalty. I don't recall being explicitly told to do so, but I felt it an intelligent thing to do for the sake of my continuing to be. As I reached the ground, however, I again lost consciousness as the nightmare began to emerge, its mouth opening to reveal concentric rings of teeth and emitting a bellowing groan, akin to a great horn signaling battle. I awoke this time where I had fallen with a mouthful of sand and that hungover feeling. There was a full moon, evocative of the thing's pale gaze. I was forced then to accept what I had seen as real. Upon awakening I reluctantly went down to the water to rinse my mouth of the sand, but found it rancid, congealed with a layer of briny foam and the smell of decaying shellfish. There were great divides in the sand, as if something had been dragged. I returned to my collection basin and then noticed the collapsed trees and trampled undergrowth. A horrible notion struck me, and I ran back to the Emma, only to find it absent. I then thought for the first time that I had overstayed my welcome on Stewart Island. Quickly I gathered what was left of my supplies back at the shoreline and began hiking northeast towards Oban at dawn, any hope of salvaging my adventure firmly severed. I would gladly resume my yuppie life in the States if it meant never having another encounter with the behemoth. For the first hour or two I made excellent time, motivated by my panic, and perhaps sufficient to cut a day from the duration of my hike. But I hadn't truly rested for days, and it began to take its toll. Sometime around noon I leaned against a tree to rest. I despised stopping, yet slept almost instantly, my mind and body finally giving in to fatigue. As I slept, I experienced what can only be described as a prophecy. I stood back in the water where I had fallen under, my back to the shore. I watched the black water as it progressed from fine bubbling to roiling. I could sense that I should wade towards land, but was unable to turn around. At last I could see the eyes, still entrancing. As they rose to the surface, I again could smell the spoiled crustacean odor, and as the thing's head breached, I tried to scream but could only gasp as I fell forward into the acrid turmoil of the monster's lair. Submerged, I opened my eyes and viewed the creature's arms and torso. It appeared oddly humanoid, but covered in scales and barnacles. Massive crabs skittered about on its skin, having made their homes in the various marine flora present there. It extended down into nothing, but continued to rise, its legs yet visible, as it became apparent that I could not comprehend the monstrosity's true size. I turned my attention to coming up for air and broke the surface. I awoke screaming and chilled, and with that my recount has come to an end, as I turn about and realize that somehow I am back at my campsite. A quote from an author who escapes me at the moment comes to mind. The most merciful thing in the world is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. My waking cognizance suddenly comprehends the totality of what has transpired and is driving me mad. Somehow what I have done here has awoken something that has been dormant for time immeasurable, and like me it tires of the world as it is. It beckons me to help it escape. As I walk out to its cursed pit, I understand that the world is ready for harvest, and I cannot purge its call emanating from the cavernous depths.
when I was a child, it was just me and my mother. We lived in a property owned by my grandma, a three-story old farmhouse right at the fringe of the woods. It was far off the road, down a long, unlit gravel driveway. It felt very isolated at night, being so distant from any other houses, set in an area that hadn't been inhabited for thirty years before we started living in it. Quite often I was a fairly rambunctious child, so while my mom went off to work, I would occasionally skip the morning bus to school and stay home alone all day. The big house had a habit of feeling incredibly lonely and sparse, so I spent most of my time playing in the forest expanse out back, some distance into the woods, far enough that I couldn't hear my mother when she called. There was a toppled pine tree which had crashed into another, an even larger trunk on its way down was now frozen there, forming a long arc over the forest floor. I loved to climb up the jagged stump at the base of this fallen tree and then steady myself to a point just above the middle. I was never able to make it all the way to the top because it just got too steep for me to continue any further, and I had a bad habit of freaking out from how high up I was. One day, I was sitting in my usual spot on the fallen tree, which was a good distance from the ground, just listening to the birds singing and simultaneously feeling the warmth of the sun on my neck, when I heard something strange from underneath that paralyzed me in shock. Hey, kid. I was gripped by a sudden strong surge of fear for a moment. The voice had come from directly underneath me. I strained to look down but couldn't see anything over the ledge. For a long time, I just sat there in absolute silence and I was at the point where I was almost soon to convince myself that I had imagined hearing a man's voice at all. I know you can hear me. His voice was much louder this time as I yelled something out and scrambled up the log a bit higher. Trembling nervously, I dug my fingernails into the bark and held tight for dear life. I sat there trying to collect my nerves for God knows how long. Although I couldn't see it, the presence of the thing underneath me was still clear. The bird song was much softer and more cautious this time, and when I listened closely I swear I could hear the faintest echo of human breathing. Gathering all my courage I vowed to prove to myself that it was all my imagination by leaning over the ledge as far as I possibly could without slipping right off. Digging hard into the bark behind me, I stretched out along my arms and peered over, getting a full view of the empty forest floor and undergrowth when suddenly, come down here or I'll come up and grab you. It was so loud it was as if it was being screamed right in my face. I released my grip on the tree in fright and plunged off the platform. I was saved only by grabbing a nearby branch, and for one awful second, my bare legs dangled in the cool air. When I pulled myself up, I ran at full speed to the top of the collapsed pine, to the point I had never reached before. I sat there just below the rustling canopy, pissing myself and staring at the distant base where the splintered wood rose fully expecting at any moment to see someone crawling rapidly up the pine towards me. Instead, all I heard was the wind whistling in the leaves above and below me, and occasional snippets of birdsong. It was about two hours before my mother got home and found me, after much worried searching, trembling, and crying at the top of the fallen tree. Although this incident spooked both me and mother, in time I somehow recovered, exhibiting that naive, hard skin of a child although I never went as far into the forest as I used to, and never again even approached that fallen tree. Once when I was twelve I had the chore of taking firewood from the shed out back, just at the edge of the woods, and to bring it back inside the house. It was a tiresome job, and I always chose to do it at dusk when the air was brimming with mosquitoes and a swampy fog that usually coated the lawn. By the time I had made my last round, I would sprint back to the house, spooked. One of my least favorite things about this job was that the shed was full of barn owls. If you have ever seen a barn owl's face staring at you from a dark roof corner, then you will know how uncomfortable that she had made me. One of these nights it got mistier than it had ever been before. A thick silver fog covered everything and limited my line of sight to a short sphere around me. Even though the shed wasn't far from the house, I found myself feeling disoriented, and more than once I walked in the wrong direction both times for some reason walking straight into the woods. By the time I had reached my last load, it was too foggy to see the street. My eyes stung in the moisture and it made my vision blur. Lurching forward, I managed to walk head first into a tree, doubling over and dropping all of the wood I was bundling onto my feet with a hard crunch. 
As I went to pick them up, with my foot throbbing pretty hard, I realized that the ground was too misty for me to see my own knees. I decided to head to the house, since we had more than enough wood for one night. However, it was getting to be pretty dark, and I couldn't make out any signifiers of which direction I was heading in. Even though I cautiously walked for several feet in all directions, trying to figure out my position in the mists, I still couldn't figure out any point of identification. I couldn't even locate the fence or the gate, and the more I walked, the more I seemed to stumble into trees, pine needles, and mud crunching under my feet instead of dew-covered lawn. After a while, I finally realized that I couldn't even find the shed anymore. Cursing myself for being so dumb while trying to ignore my thumping heart and sense that something else was at play, I became aware that I was lost somewhere in the fringe of the forest. Screaming out for my mother at the loudest possible volume was only met with a resounding silence from the depths of the mist all around from where I stood, affirming that I had wandered too far from the house to be heard. As a deep panic started to settle on me, I noticed a glimpse of something pink moving against a nearby pine trunk. Coming closer, I saw that it was a ripped-out square of pink paper. On it, there was an arrow pointing left. Looks vaguely like something my mom might make, I rationalized, to keep me from getting lost. So, foolishly, I followed the direction set by that green arrow, shivering in the increasing cold. I kept walking for about five to ten minutes before needing to stop to take a breath. My heart was pounding so fast it was beginning to hurt. As I was sitting down, however, I spied what appeared to be another note fluttering on a nearby trunk. I noticed that this one was embedded with a long nail. It bore another arrow, this one pointing up, and a small sloppily written note that said, This way. Despite my increasing panic, I convinced myself that these notes were my only shot at getting back before nightfall. I was desperate to get the hell out, and my brow was cold with sweat. So I followed the green arrow, to a point where I could just dimly make out another spot of pink, up an incline of collapsed stumps and leaf litter. At this point it was getting pretty dark, and I had to strain both my eyes just to see a few meters ahead of me. Following the green arrows, feeling less and less sure of where I was, I stumbled through the woods, groping out in the mist to feel for trees, although I was terrified of something unseen grabbing my arm. I came across the third green note, which had another arrow pointing up again. This one led to an increasingly steep slope that I didn't recognize being anywhere near my house, and with a poorly drawn smiley face right above it. At this stage I became too freaked to cope and started to cry there a little. As I slumped against the pine stump, the possibility that I would be out in these woods all night was beginning to sink in, like a syringe being driven into the veins within my arm. I caught a glimpse of another pink square in the near distance, squinting hard, unnerved by these notes, all of which looked fresh and without sign of decay despite the previous week's non-stop rain. I read it from afar. What I read made my blood turn cold. I stood to my knees, dead silently, wobbling on them in fear. My ears were sensitive to any tiny prickle of noise in the mist. For a long time I stood there in the rolling fog, reading and rereading that horrible note over and over again, before a snapping stick somewhere behind me caused me to sprint, blindly, twigs snagging at my ankles and cutting up my face as I ran. Written on the note, in big green letters, was my name. It felt like I was running for hours. All the while, the rain and mist lapped at the back of my neck like the decaying breath of someone running right behind me. Somehow I made it back to the house. All the lights were off, and I struggled to find the keys for a moment. When I found them, I bolted indoors and quickly crawled into bed, where I remained, unsleeping till morning. Mom just thought I'd come inside and gone to bed, and hadn't thought to leave the lights on. It was a miracle a.k.a. some freakish coincidence that I even found the house at all. The final incident at that damn house was witnessed only by my mother. Up until then she had never experienced any of the strange things as I had, although we mutually shared the peculiar oppressive quality that the house's interior had on us and its placement in the dreary imposing woods. Although I was obviously never a popular kid, by living way out in the country in the opposite direction from everyone else at my school, I did make some tight friends in my first year of high school. One of these friends, Amanda was her name, invited me over one night, and I accepted. 
My mother drove me out to the place, which was about three miles away, then drove back home. The night went well. We watched a horror movie, suitably, devoured some pizza, and probably smoked a little pot. My mother went home alone where she intended to get some writing done. She worked for a magazine at that point. It was about midnight when I received an off-putting text from Mom in all caps. Is this a prank I need to know immediately? Thinking it was some kind of joke, I texted back, Calm herself, is what a prank? Almost immediately, the response, Are you at the house? Of course I responded, No, though I was thoroughly weirded out. I didn't receive another message until around 3 a.m., when she told me to go to my grandma's in the morning and to not, by any means, dare go home. I remember those bleak torrents of rain the day I went to my grandmother's and how terribly soaked I was when I finally got there. It was nearly two towns away. I'd had to fight the temptation to go home and drop off my bags, but Mom's disturbing messages from last night were enough of a warning not to do so. When I arrived, Mom and Grandma were having lunch. At first, my mother seemed to be in some sort of a composed state, but when I got a better look at her, I noticed that all of the color had drained from her face and she was slightly trembling. At one point, she even sent a small glass crashing to the floor after flinching at the cat brushing around her ankles. It wasn't until later that night, when my grandma was sound asleep, that she told me what happened. She went further as to forbid me from telling old grandma, out of fear that it would horrify her superstitious soul too much. This was what happened the night when I was at Amanda's, as she described in lurid detail. My mother was sitting on the first story in the living room, where she sat on the couch by the fire. Curtains opened to the view of the sunset on the canopy, going over her latest draft. At first it was so faint that she barely noticed it, but after a while my mother became aware of and vaguely irritated by tiny thumping noises near her head at the window. When she went over to investigate, she saw fat brown moths of a kind we often got at that place, buzzing madly into the glass. Reasoning that this was the cause of the sound, she returned to her work, however feeling rattled in some way. It was when the noises started to get sharper and louder that she paid more attention and saw that rocks were being thrown at the window from the total blackness of the forest edge. She saw them appear from the shadows of the bush and then fall in an arc and bounce off the window. Looking carefully, she could see small cracks from where some heavy ones had hit, right beside where her head had been moments before. Temporarily captivated, she tried to peer into the darkness enough to make out where the rocks were being thrown from. Then, with a startled shock, she jumped back from the window as she saw me standing half behind a tree right near the window, grinning wide and staring at her. My one visible eye stretched wide open, showing all the white. She barely stifled a scream seeing her own daughter standing there, just staring and smiling. Not only did the figure not move nor blink, it was standing by one of the nearest pines, far from where the rocks were shooting up out of the bush as they continued to do so in a loud downpour. My face unceasingly continued to press out at her, smiling. Thinking this was all some kind of sick prank, hence the later text, my mother shouted my name at the top of her lungs, frightened to the core. However, instead of responding, the mouth of the thing, that looked like me, behind the tree just started moving as if it were mouthing silent words really, really fast. Suddenly it turned its head to the side and seemed to be talking to someone else behind the tree, my mom said, who couldn't be seen. But she could see a formless black shape hanging against the other side of the tree. The girl that looked like me kept staring at my mother and doing the silent speed-talking thing, then turning and whispering to the thing next to her. Then she would turn back and start up again. Then, breaking the monotonous spell, she suddenly pointed straight at my mother and started laughing. My mother screamed and fled to my bedroom on the second story, the only room with a working lock, where she shut herself in and sat at the far end of the bed as the rocks began to pitter-patter against the window downstairs, dry heaving and weeping in fear. In my room, my mother said she did not feel safe. There was an awful smell and a weird humming noise in the walls, as she described. She tried to pray for a time before giving up and just listening to the rocks pelt the walls and windows. Somewhere in the kitchen, she caught the distinct, vibrant sound of a window actually smashing, and the weird, continuous humming. Listening more carefully, she could identify it as the softest hint of a mumbling voice. In absolute horror, she recognized the voice and then, 
virtually too afraid to look. She tilted her head up to the closet door where an awful white face could be seen staring right at her, mouth contorting and gaping in what sounded like highly sped-up whispering. The closet door was only a meter from my mother. It started to open slowly. In an unimaginable explosion of terror, she immediately bolted to the door, only to fumble with the lock as bigger and bigger rocks came crashing through the window, which burst apart in a spray of glass shards, before finally getting out, running out of the house, completely keeping her eyes off the woods, getting into her car and driving off. She said that as she glanced back, right at the end of the prolonged drive, she saw two unmistakable human forms standing at my broken bedroom window, watching as her car got further and further away from our house. This would be their final farewell, as my mother never stepped foot in that place again. As my mother told this story, she broke down into tears. I didn't doubt her, and I still don't. I honestly and fully believe that she experienced what she says she did. It was also quite clear that we were done living in that house for once and for all. I only went back once with my dad, who I see very rarely now. He came from another state to help us move. Mom had already found a place in town and moved in. My dad and I just loaded up his truck with all that was left inside there. It was a silent, sunny morning when we removed all the stuff and emptied the place. I wish I could say there was some closure, some final spooking to cap it all off, but there wasn't. It was just a relief to be out of there. There are, however, only two things left worth mentioning. One, when we checked the house for any signs of intruders, we found that several windows, including one in my bedroom and the kitchen, had been smashed and rocks were lying on the floor. Two, Dad went out into the trees for a bit to take a leak. When he came back, he asked how long we'd had the swing set for. Needless to say, we'd never had a swing set, so I was fairly unsettled to discover that in the week since we'd been gone, Someone had assembled a rope swing set from one of the highest branches of the old pine over the ridge, against which was the fallen log I'd stopped climbing many years ago. It was obviously new rope, and a nicely polished, sanded-down wooden seat at the base. Dad, wanting to keep my mind from recent events, he doubted the affair and thought my mother was mentally unstable, said that a neighbor probably set it up, not realizing it was on our property. Of course, he knew as well as I did that we had literally no neighbors for at least a mile in any direction. There were no houses in all that space, and never in my time living there did I ever see any other signs of human habitation. But I let it all go, and was pleased enough just to say good riddance to that horrible place as we drove off for good. For the most part, I found it best to try and forget what happened at that place. Sometimes I just can't help but ponder it, though. It's been long enough now that I no longer feel scared talking about it, but for a long while, I couldn't. Seeing as it is Halloween, what better time to share? My grandma just recently sold the house to a new family, that being a young couple and their little son, shortly after we moved out, despite my mother's desperate insistence that it be left empty. Now she refuses to talk about what happened altogether. I'm less anxious about it, although sometimes I can't help but let my imagination get the better of me. All I can do is think of that old house, the fallen down tree, the new occupants, and the swing out back, gently spinning in the breeze as that little boy toddles obliviously towards it. Ryan reached the top of the hill and looked down onto the town of Prisca. It was a small one-horse town in the upper Karoo Desert. The old church in the middle of the town still stood tall, the clock tower casting a long shadow in the late afternoon sun. The town looked like it was in a fairly good condition compared to many of the other places he had passed through, though it seemed just as abandoned, which was seldom actually the case. He sighed and scanned the streets and buildings for any sign of life. He had been walking for hours and he was exhausted. The old Ford Focus he had managed to get running in Pochefstrom had finally given in about 25 kilometers back, and he had been walking since. The hot desert sun had not made it easy, but he had made it. He needed to find food, shelter, and new transport, and hopefully he would be on his way to Namibia sooner rather than later. Ryan pulled the pair of binoculars he had out of his pack and scanned the town again for a couple of minutes. There were a few shops in Prieska which had sold food and supplies, though these would more than likely have been looted since. He was inclined to check the general store, 
seeing as Priesca was a farm town, but it would probably also be empty. Surrounding farms could prove fruitful and might warrant a trip out, but he would avoid prolonging his stay close to town if he could. Where there were towns, trouble was usually not far off. A slight movement caught his eye in the window of a building he was examining. He quickly jerked the binoculars to focus on this particular window, and he thought he just caught a glimpse of someone moving out of sight. He examined the building for a few moments longer, waiting for another glimpse at what had caught his eye. But all was quiet once again. Ryan sighed again. Of course the town wouldn't be empty. Why would anything ever be easy? Lowering the binoculars, he glanced up at the sinking sun. He had to get under cover before nightfall, especially if he wasn't alone. He packed away his binoculars, shouldered his pack, picked up his rifle, and started down the hill. He knew Priesca well. In the native Karana tongue, Priesca translated to the place of the lost she-goat. His grandparents had lived there for many years, and growing up he had often visited. The butchery was where they sold the best biltong he had ever tasted, and the small corner shop often gave him free candy when he entered. But his favorite place in town was the old fort on the Priesca copy. The British had built it during the Anglo-Boer War, and the sense of history he had felt when he first visited it had always lured him back. He looked up and could see it on the other side of the town. It seemed to watch over the small town in an ominous silence. Ryan descended the hill and reached the edge of town as the sun was lowering behind the buildings. Time to focus, buddy. He cocked his Remington and took a few deep breaths to steady himself. He didn't know what to expect, and after all this time he still wasn't sure what he dreaded more, coming across bandits or lurkers. One thing he had learned on his journey from Johannesburg was that people were capable of unparalleled cruelty, and they could be just as fear-inducing as any lurker he had come across. And he had come across many. He quickly moved up to the closest building, looking in all directions as he approached. Slowly, he peered around the wall and down the street heading into Priesca. Nothing stirred. Cautiously, he headed down the street, staying low and close to the building. It was some sort of government building and held no real interest for him. Shelter was now his number one concern, as the lurkers became particularly active after sundown. This he had learned early on in his exodus from Johannesburg, when he had at first opted to travel only by night to avoid the desperate people looking for help, and those people who always seemed to thrive in humanity's darkest times. These people seemed to enjoy the lawlessness and the suffering, and they were more than willing to add to it if it benefited them. Reaching an intersection, he quickly scanned both ways and behind him before proceeding. The residential area started only a few blocks ahead of him, and he figured he would be able to hole up in an abandoned house for the night. It was now fully dark, but the full moon gave a generous amount of light. Ryan had crossed another intersection when he heard a groan and footsteps around the next corner. He froze and backed up a few steps. Raising the rifle, he steeled himself for what would emerge. Another groan and then a hiss came from around the corner, and a few seconds later a small figure stepped into view. Ryan recoiled. He had seen many lurkers, but this was new even for him. A boy of no more than three stood a few feet before him. At least it used to be a boy. The boy's eyes were a feral yellow. Unfocused and crazed, he was bleeding from his mouth, and his skin had a grayish hue to it, like ash. Black veins were all over his body, thick and bulging as if they were struggling to pump the blood through. This was the youngest lurker Ryan had ever seen. They were always young, but never this young. He looked up at Ryan and at first it seemed as if he looked right through him. Then his eyes seemed to focus, and hate and anger filled them. He hissed like a snake and sprang forward, coming at Ryan at full tilt. The scariest thing about lurkers were their speed, and what took him off guard even more was the agility of the young, former young boy. Ryan had been frozen when he saw the boy, but now with a hissing feral lurker charging at him, his survival instinct which had kept him alive for so long quickly kicked in, he raised his rifle and fired a single shot, hitting the lurker mid-leap and instantly dropping him. The gunshot's echo thundered through the small town, and now Ryan was in trouble. If there were more lurkers around, they would come running. If there were bandits around, so would they. Usually Ryan dispatched single lurkers with the trusty hand axe he kept at his side. 
but the young lurker had shocked him out of his wits. Quickly chambering another round, he started forward again, this time jogging. An instant later, he heard a shriek to his left, which was answered by another to his right. Well, shit, he started sprinting. He heard shrieks, screams, and hisses approaching from both sides, and Ryan started to panic. He was desperately looking around for a place of safety, anything that could save him from the oncoming death rush. He glanced over his shoulder, but the street was empty, for now. He spotted a small side street a couple of yards ahead and ducked into it. Clambering onto a nearby dumpster, he was able to reach the roof of the adjoining building and quickly hoisted himself up. He rolled away from the edge and took a few calming breaths. Slowly, he peered over the edge just as a dozen or so of the lurkers poured into the street from each direction. Searching for the cause of the gunshot, they sprinted up and down the street, teeth gnashing. The black veins crisscrossing their bodies were visible to Ryan even from a distance. They quickly found the body of the one he had killed, and anger seemed to ripple through the group. Their gnashing and hissing intensified, and they raced up and down the street looking for the one responsible. It had been three years since Revelations the media had named it after the book in the Bible, had crashed into the desert of Texas in the United States. The large asteroid had done considerable damage to the area, but as it had crashed in a fairly deserted area, few human lives were lost. It was what came after that had given the asteroid its name. Days after the asteroid hit, reports began to come in of first responders dying of some sort of disease. Doctors were baffled as it started very much like flu, but quickly escalated with Ebola-like symptoms. Soon the afflicted would die of massive organ failure, only hours after the first symptoms showed. After the scientists that visited the scene began to die as well, the connection was made to the asteroid and the crash site was quarantined. The last few people to have come in contact with the asteroid quickly died. The families and anyone who had come in close proximity to the responders and scientists were also quarantined, as they had no idea if the disease was infectious. But after days of tests and monitoring, it was concluded that the disease was in fact not infectious, and the quarantined people were allowed to leave. They were so, so wrong. Ryan's attention was brought back to the present when a lurker entered the side street he had used to get to the roof and started sniffing around the dumpster. Ryan had quickly learned a few important things about them through his various encounters. They were extremely fast, you can't outrun them. On top of that, they had incredible endurance. They never stopped coming. Once they saw you or smelled you, which was another thing that made them difficult to evade, they would pursue you relentlessly, risking self-injury and even death to try and reach you. They had no inclination to self-preservation whatsoever. The only thing that seemed to drive them was their need to kill. They did not feed on humans. In fact, Ryan had never seen them eat anything. They merely killed them. The only way Ryan knew how to get a lurker off of your tail was to kill it, or to put enough distance between yourself and it. And that meant kilometers. Ryan watched the lurker continue sniffing the dumpster, and suddenly it looked up. Somehow Ryan had expected this, and was just able to duck behind the edge in time to avoid being spotted. But if it had his scent, it would soon attempt to follow him onto the roof. Ryan quickly scanned the roof and summed up his options. He saw the neighboring building was a two-story, and that he might be able to jump onto the balcony. Not really having much choice, he quietly sprang up and carefully made his way to the edge. The balcony was slightly lower than he was, but it was a fair distance away. He shouldered the rifle and took a few quick breaths. Tensing his whole body, he managed a few quick steps and jumped. His hands caught the railing of the balcony and his body slammed into it, causing it to rattle. He tried to pull himself up, but his left hand slipped on the cool metal and he almost dropped into the alley below. Hanging by one hand, he looked down and saw several lurkers speeding this way and that. They had not looked up yet. With a great effort, he managed to get his left hand onto the railing again and started to pull himself up. He was soon able to use his legs to help himself up, and seconds later he was on the correct side of the railing. He was panting, and Ryan stood with his hands on his knees, looking back the way he had come. He was about to turn when he heard the click of a revolver being cocked behind his head. Slowly straighten, then drop your rifle and pack on the ground. Don't turn around. It was a female voice, with a thick Afrikaan accent, and he guessed the person behind it fairly young. 
Look, I don't want any trouble. I'm just running from those things, please. He spoke calmly and clearly. I don't really care. Do as I say or you'll soon join them down there. Ryan slowly straightened, unslung his rifle and pack, and carefully laid them on the ground. The woman stepped forward and Ryan could hear her crouch to grab his rifle. In a flash, he spun around the other way, in the same movement drawing his small axe from its sheath beneath his coat. He grabbed the wrist she was holding the revolver in and jerked it sideways, causing her to drop the weapon. He then spun her around and in another swift movement pinned her arm behind her, slammed her against the wall and brought the axe up to her throat. This all happened in maybe three seconds. She tensed, but mostly seemed shocked by the speed at which he had disarmed her. I don't want to hurt you. I'm just passing through town and I got attacked. I didn't even know there was anyone in this place. She tried to look at him, but he still held her firmly against the wall, her cheek flat against it. Now I'm going to let you go. I don't want to hurt you, but that doesn't mean that I won't, if you leave me no choice. Stay calm, don't do anything stupid, and we'll both live through the night so that we can die tomorrow. Do we have an understanding? She seemed to think for a second, but then slowly nodded. Ryan released her and stepped back, quickly stooping to retrieve her revolver. She turned around, rubbing her wrist and then her cheek. She was beautiful and young. Ryan guessed her at no more than twenty. She was the youngest person that he had seen since everything had started. Well, the youngest normal person. She had wild, curly black hair and bright blue eyes. Even in the moonlight, he could see that she had freckles. To be honest, I don't know. But the way they attack you definitely isn't. Have you killed any of them? Was it your gunshot I heard earlier? Yes, and yes. She looked him up and down again, this time with what seemed to be a little more respect. How did you do that? She asked as he sheathed his axe. Do what? Take my gun away from me so quickly. Are you some kind of soldier? He chuckled humorlessly. I've just been on the road a very long time, and it's something I had to learn along the way. She looked impressed. Where are you from? Joburg. Look, I'll answer all the questions you want, but can we please go inside? She looked him up and down and nodded. She headed into the room, and he followed. It was pitch black inside, and he could barely make out what he thought was some furniture. He turned and she closed the glass sliding door. Then she closed a heavy, sturdy-looking metal gate, which she then proceeded to lock with two bolts and a key. After this, she moved to a corner close to the door and lifted what looked like plywood, which she placed in front of the door and locked in place with improvised latches. Finally, she drew the curtains closed. They were thick, black, and spilled all the way onto the floor. Taking a few steps into the room, she passed Ryan and then bent down, a second later, a match sparked into life and she used this to light a lantern. She took the lantern and switched on two more camping lights. She turned to look at Ryan. They're solar-powered, so that makes things easier. As his eyes adjusted, he looked around. They were in what Ryan guessed was probably the open-plan living room of a larger flat. He could see a makeshift kitchen and there were two couches, an armchair, and a bed in the corner of the living room. She saw him looking around. I used to live here with my mom and sister. There is a downstairs as well, but after, I didn't need that much space and it felt safer being up here. I only go down there when I have to go out and then only in the day. That's smart. They're not very active in daylight. Why is that? she asked. I really don't know. So you've been on your own since the beginning? How have you survived? He was really interested, but he knew as soon as he said it that it came across as an insult literal amazement that she was still alive. Hey, fuck you, buddy, she said fiercely. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it like that. I meant how did you survive, literally? What did you do for food supplies? Were there bandits and how did you dodge the lurkers? That's all. She glared at him for a couple of seconds but said nothing. He looked down at his shoes and then back up at her. How did you manage to block off everything like this, he said, and gestured to the fortified door they had just passed through. Her look softened a little, and then she smirked. I've just been alone a very long time, and it's something I had to learn along the way. Ryan smiled. Are you thirsty? I've got quite a lot of water, even a couple of bottles of booze. Water would be great, thanks. 
She moved off to the kitchen while Ryan chose the comfortable-looking armchair that gave him a great view of the door that he assumed led downstairs and the door they had just passed through. He sank down onto it, and it really was comfortable. Laying his pack and his rifle next to him, he sat back in the chair and sighed deeply. He had had a very long day and he was exhausted. He closed his eyes. A few days after the quarantine people were released, the news started reporting some very disturbing things. At first it was only isolated reports in Texas, but soon these reports were coming from all over America. Children were attacking and killing their parents. Well, at first it was their parents, then it started to look like anyone was free game. News reports about children killing their parents in their sleep were heard. Stories of whole classrooms turning on their teachers and ripping them to shreds came to light. Videos of children throwing their parents and bystanders off of balconies in shopping malls became all the more frequent. Something was making the children in America crazy. Soon some people started connecting the dots, noting that some of the first attacks by kids were by the children of first responders, the same first responders who had died due to a mysterious disease. Some believed that the disease they had died from had somehow passed to the children, making them insane. It was around this time that other countries started reporting the same horrific stories. South Africa was one of the first. It had always been a popular tourist destination. Scientists then concluded that the only way this sickness would be able to spread so quickly was if it was airborne. It was theorized that adults could carry it and help to spread it, even though no symptoms were ever noted in adults. Within a few weeks, containment measures were put in place, but it was too late. It, it was global, and the authorities had no plan, no way forward, and no cure. Only a couple of days before entire countries started going dark, scientists released the last and perhaps the most disturbing finding. Babies' fetuses in the womb were also susceptible, and countless pregnant women had died. Though the explanation was hard to swallow, their unborn children had killed them from the inside. Even after the mother had died and the fetus had been removed, it still showed heightened agility and aggression. It was also theorized that children up to the age of 17 or 18 were still susceptible, but it seemed to also depend on the individual. Some 16-year-olds remained unaffected, while some young adults of up to 20 years of age were afflicted. It was literally the end of the world. Not only was all the youth of the world going into murderous rampages, but no new children were being born. It was the end of man. Ryan was jerked awake by a loud bang. Grabbing his rifle, he jumped up and looked around, fighting off the sleep which he had so recklessly allowed to take him. He saw Helena standing in the kitchen, eyes wide with fear. The bang came again and Ryan realized that it was coming from the door through which they had entered earlier. Fuck, he hissed. They must have followed me here. Glass shattered and he knew that they had broken the glass door. The large metal gate rattled. We need to move now, he said to Helena, but she remained still, staring at the covered door. Helena now. Ryan slung his pack on and moved toward her. The gate will hold. They can't get in, she whimpered, tears beginning to stream down her face. He reached her and took hold of her shoulders. Look at me, Helena, look at me, he ordered, and she finally looked into his eyes. I know you're scared. I am too, but we have to get out of here. Nothing holds against them forever. They will get in. She sobbed again, but nodded. Grab whatever food and water you have, quick. Ryan turned, keeping an eye on the door while she hurried about the small kitchen, throwing cans of food and bottles of water into a backpack. The gate was still being attacked, and Ryan heard something break. One of the deadbolts must have broken. Ryan waited as long as he could, but after a couple of seconds more, he felt they had to move. Okay, that's enough. We have to go. Which door? He took her arm and led her to the two other doors in the room. She pointed at the one opposite the balcony. Ryan opened it and found another large piece of plywood blocking their path. With a savage kick, he sent it tumbling down the stairs leading down. Quickly but cautiously, he led the way down, his rifle raised and ready. The first floor was pitch black, but he sensed that it was a much larger room than the one upstairs. Which way, he whispered as the racket upstairs continued. The back door's that way. It comes out below the balcony. Front door it is, he replied. She took his arm and led him to the right, around the obstacles. As his eyes adjusted, he thought he saw two bodies against a wall, but he couldn't be sure. 
Helena moved out in front of him and bent down. He heard two clicks, and then she stood up and he heard two more clicks. She removed another large piece of plywood and a wooden door with a small window was revealed. Light streamed in, and Ryan couldn't help but look back at where he thought he saw the bodies. His night vision had proved to be correct, as two skeletal bodies were propped up against the wall in sitting positions. The one looked to be no more than a child and the other adult. He looked back at her and saw her staring at them, too. She looked into his eyes and new tears were flowing freely. He looked down for a moment and then stepped up to the door. Looking through the window, the street looked empty. A loud crash came from upstairs as the gate came down. Come on, he whispered and tried opening the door. It was locked, but Helena quickly stepped forward and flipped the deadbolts and removed the chain. He opened the door an inch and peered out. Quickly he stepped out and allowed her to follow, and then quietly shut the door. They could hear the lurkers crashing down the stairs, looking for them. Ryan headed in the direction of the fort, hoping to hide there until sunrise. He felt they needed to get out of the center of town, away from the obviously large concentration of lurkers. Where are we going? Helena whispered behind him. To the fort. Why? They've got my scent. That's how they followed me to your place. We need to get out of town and away from them. Put some distance between us. If we hide somewhere in town, they'll quickly find us again. They stayed close to the buildings, trying to keep low. Ryan had them move quickly, and they could hear the sounds of the lurkers echoing through the town. A couple of times they ducked into doorways or behind trees when they spotted one. It was chilling seeing these former children running rabid around the town, knowing that at any moment they could be seen and attacked. The final stretch was open ground. They'd have to cross a road, a small field, and a graveyard before reaching the bottom of the copy. Ryan scanned the area looking for lurkers but spotted none. Come on. He started jogging and Helena followed. They had just reached the graveyard when they heard a shriek behind them. The same lurker who had sniffed around the dumpster had spotted them or tracked him. It was about sixty meters away and it was a large one. Ryan guessed that it had probably been a sports star in the old world. Its shriek had alerted others, and within seconds, six lurkers were bearing down on them. Run! Ryan screamed, and Helena took off into the graveyard. Ryan raised his rifle and got the closest one in his sights. Squeezing the trigger, the rifle fired and the lurker dropped. The others didn't seem to notice, they only kept coming. Ryan chambered another round and fired. Another one dropped. Ryan again chambered around and brought another one down. He turned and sprinted after Helena, reloading as he ran. The remaining three were after him and they were gaining quickly. Reloading while running was not easy, but Ryan had managed it on previous occasions. Finally, he was done. Glancing over his shoulder, he saw that they had gained significantly and were only a couple of meters behind him. He was about to turn to take down one or two more when his foot caught on a broken headstone protruding from the ground. He went sprawling and the rifle flew from his hands. Landing hard, he could hear the gnashing, hissing monsters approaching. He desperately crawled forward to where the rifle had landed, panic threatening to take hold. Reaching it, he grabbed it and turned, still lying on his back. A lurker was almost on him, and he fired immediately, striking it in the chest. It crumpled to the ground, almost landing on top of him. He quickly ejected the spent cartridge and chambered another, but before he could pull the trigger, the next one was on him. It dived onto him causing him to once again lose the rifle. Ryan managed to get his hands up, keeping it away from his neck as it tried to rip his throat open with its teeth. Soon its hands were wrapped around Ryan's neck and it started squeezing. Ryan started panicking as his windpipe was cut off. With his right hand he let go of the lurker and reached under his coat. Drawing his small axe he put it to the creature's neck, and with all his strength in both hands he jammed it upward. Blood spewed from the wound covering Ryan's face and chest, but the lurker became limp, and Ryan threw it aside. Coughing and retching, he got to his knees before he was shaken by the sound of another gunshot. His head whipped up just to see the final lurker dropping, most of its head gone. Ryan looked to where the rifle had dropped and saw Helena standing there, the rifle in her hands and the barrel smoking. Ryan collapsed into a sitting position, taking a few more moments to cough and to get his breath back. Finally, he looked up at Helena, 
who had walked over and was now crouching beside him. Thanks, he managed before bursting into another coughing fit. No problem. She smiled back. Ryan looked at the one she had shot and saw that it was the big one that had tracked him. We have to move. The gunshots will draw them here. He wheezed and got to his feet. He took the rifle back from her and reloaded. He only had a dozen rounds left. They headed to the fort, now looming over them in the night sky, the moon right behind it. In the dark, it looked like an old castle. It made Ryan think of Dracula. They had just started climbing the hill when they heard more shrieks behind them. He looked back and saw dozens, maybe hundreds of lurkers pouring into the field. Go, 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 he yelled, and they doubled their pace. The hill wasn't very steep, but the climb was tricky due to lots of loose gravel and rocks. Twice in a matter of seconds, they both slid back several feet. Halfway up, Ryan glanced back and saw that several lurkers had already reached the bottom of the hill. The only thing going for them at this stage was that the lurkers attacked the hill with such speed and aggression that they too constantly slid back down. Ryan thought about firing off a couple of rounds, but there were too many and the effect would be minimal. He focused again on scaling the hill and eventually they reached the top. They were both panting, and looking down they saw that some of their pursuers were already halfway up. What now? Helena asked, panic seemingly just under the surface. Ryan took a moment and looked around. The fort was a couple of meters in front of them, and a small shed was to the right of it, no more than a few meters wide. The fort was about six meters high, and the rock it was built from protruded slightly, giving Ryan an idea. Climb the fort, he said simply. Helena looked at him as if he was mad. What? Climb the fort. We get on top. It has no door, so we can't go inside. They'll break down that shed in seconds, and we can't go running into the night over flat plains. They'll catch us before we had made a kilometer. If we make it to sunrise, we might have a chance. They're not the best climbers, and I still have a couple of rounds left. She stared at him for a couple of seconds more, internally debating what he had said. Making up her mind, she ran to the fort and he followed. He gave her a boost and followed after she was more than halfway up. They reached the top fairly easily as there were several good gripping places along the wall. Ryan only hoped that the lurker's blind aggression and insanity prevented them from finding them too. They sat on the edge of the roof and waited. The original roof had caved in many years before and it had been replaced by flimsy corrugated metal. It looked very precarious. They heard the sounds of the creatures struggling up the hill, and it was becoming louder and louder. Ryan had given Helena his axe, and he sat ready, waiting with his loaded rifle. Was that your mom and sister? Ryan asked gently. She didn't respond immediately. Yes, she said quietly. It wasn't long after we began seeing the things happening in Johannesburg and Pretoria that it began happening here. It was just a street kid here or there attacking adults on the main street and in front of shops. They were quickly dealt with, either locked up and some were even shot. But then the local kids began getting aggressive as well. My mom was smart enough to keep my sister in the house as soon as she saw the news stories on TV. She always was overprotective and paranoid like that. It kept my sister herself for much longer than the others. Soon the community started breaking down. There were lots and lots of kids in the township on the edge of town and one night they all stormed into Prieska, killing everyone they came across. We hid upstairs in the closet, and the next day we started boarding up the flat. We didn't have a car, we couldn't leave. I was just visiting from university, and my mom worked in the post office for fuck's sake. She had started crying. So we hid. I went out in the day with a butcher knife if we needed something, and in the evenings we boarded up the house, kept the lights off, and hid. She laughed through her tears. I don't know what we thought I would do with the knife if I ran into real trouble, but it made me feel safer. It was about a week after that initial attack that my sister started to change. She became agitated, snapping at us over the smallest thing. Two days later she began running a fever, and her skin became pale. It was almost dark that day when my mom sent me out to look for some antibiotics and something to help with the fever. I could see she didn't want to, but I insisted. I had to help my little sister. That was the only time I had been out after dark before tonight. Finding the medicine wasn't that hard. 
The town was abandoned pretty quickly, and most people left everything just like it was. When I got back to the flat, I could hear a commotion inside. I rushed through the door to my sister standing over my mom, her mouth bloody and blood gushing from my mother's neck. My little sister had killed my mom. At this she broke down, but Ryan thought that it was good that she was talking about it. He realized then that he was probably the first person she had seen in almost three years. He laid a hand on her shoulder. She came at me. No words or explanation. Not even a threat or a curse. She just attacked. I had raised my hands to protect myself and she dove me to the ground, but suddenly she went rigid and then limp. I was still holding the knife when she attacked. I had actually forgotten I had it, and I had stabbed my own sister in the heart. She broke down again, sobbing uncontrollably into Ryan's shoulder. Helena, listen. He lifted her chin and looked into her sad blue eyes. That wasn't your sister anymore. If you hadn't done what you did, you'd be dead. He wiped a tear off her cheek. And I'd be sitting here alone right now, he added with a smile. She returned his smile and suddenly kissed him. He returned her kiss. It was innocent somehow. Only asking for someone, anyone to care for her again, to not be alone anymore. For just a moment, both Helena and Ryan forgot their grief and anger and pain and lost themselves completely in that moment. But only for a moment. A high-pitched scream broke them apart and brought them back down to earth hard. The first lurker had managed to scale the gravelly hill, and it was soon joined by another and then another. Ryan got on his one knee and raised his rifle but didn't fire. The lurkers didn't immediately spot them, but started running around erratically, looking for them. Shoot them, Helena whispered. I don't have a lot of ammo. If I shoot, it has to count. One of the monsters spotted them, let loose a blood-curdling shriek, and sprinted at the fort. The others followed suit, and all of the lurkers cresting the hill did the same. Soon a sea of lurkers was gathered around the fort, all jostling, biting, and hitting to get to the front. The ones at the front were jumping and reaching for the top, but so far none had tried climbing. Ryan and Helena sat atop the fort, nervously trying to look in all directions, waiting for the first to start climbing. Eventually one lurker, he seemed to have been around fifteen, jumped and managed to grab hold of a ledge a few feet up. It seemed almost an accident, but it now knew what to do. It grabbed onto the next ledge, but when it tried for the third, in its haste it missed and went tumbling down. It fell over backwards and landed on the back of its neck. Even through the chaos they heard its neck crack. It was swallowed by the sea of lurkers and they didn't see it again. But soon another managed to grab onto a protruding piece of wall. It hoisted itself up, and it made it much higher before also tumbling down. This one returned, though, and immediately began climbing again. Others around it saw what it was doing and several more attempted to climb the old structure. The first one had made it more than halfway and was only a few feet away when Ryan finally decided that it was close enough. Firing a single shot, the lurker fell back to earth. Now, though, it seemed as if the fort was being swarmed. All around the fort they were climbing, and the biggest problem they had was not being able to see on the other side of the structure. Ryan was forced to fire six more times, sending the monsters tumbling back down. They did not have long, and would soon be overrun. Helena looked at Ryan, her eyes pleading for him to save them, but he was all out of ideas for the moment. Ryan dispatched another lurker which had nearly made it to the top when he heard Helena yell. Two of them had managed to reach the top on the other side of the fort. Ryan raised his rifle, but the weapon only clicked harmlessly. He quickly pulled out four more rounds and started reloading, but the lurkers would be on them in half the time he needed to finish. Helena raised the axe, but Ryan could see her shaking. The two lurkers jumped forward and fell right through the roof. The roof collapsed outward, and Ryan and Helena were left standing on the wall of the fort. Looking into the fort, Ryan could see lurkers streaming through the door, now trying to reach them from the inside as well. He quickly finished reloading. It was his last four rounds. He was starting to think that this had been a terrible idea. Ryan! Helena screamed. What do we do? Ryan looked at the swarm of monsters trying to climb the walls of the fort, both on the inside and out. One even made it to the top again on the opposite side, but in its haste to reach them, it fell after taking only a few steps due to overbalancing. Ryan was stumped.
and despair was about to engulf him. He could see no way out. For a moment his eyes glazed over and he remembered the last time he had seen his wife, right before her father's small Cessna 152 had taken off. She had pleaded to stay behind with him, to go searching for his brother together, but he had refused. The only thing that will make me feel better, that will keep me going, is knowing that you're safe. He had said to her through tears, I'll find Matt and then we'll meet you at your dad's farm. Just go with him, get there, make it safe. It will be okay. I will find you. I will make it. He had embraced her, but she wouldn't let go. He had had to forcefully remove her and get her into the plane, using his father-in-law's help. She had been hysterical, but finally the plane had risen into the air and out of sight, and Ryan had been alone. I will find you. I will make it, he whispered. His eyes focused again and he raised the rifle. Helena, I'm sorry, he said just as the sun started to peek over the horizon. Almost instantaneously, the lurkers quieted down and became less frenzied. Their movements slowed, almost becoming lethargic, and their screams and shrieks became low moans and grunts. Helena looked up at Ryan, and a look of frightened confusion replaced the little relief she had shown at the change in the monster's behavior. Ryan, what? I'm sorry, he said again and squeezed the trigger. The rifle roared and the bullet slammed into Helena's right thigh. She screamed and dropped the axe. She fell forward onto the wall and for a moment it seemed as if she would manage to hold on. Ryan stepped forward as if to help her, but only grabbed the pack filled with food on her back. As if in slow motion, she slid sideways and fell off down the outside of the wall, leaving the pack in Ryan's hands. She screamed again as she fell, and her eyes met Ryan's. Confusion and shock reflected there, but also sadness. She disappeared into the ocean of waiting lurkers, and they immediately attacked her. Even the monsters scaling the wall jumped off to get to her, albeit in a more distracted way than the frenzied creatures of minutes before. Her screams erupted from beneath the mass of murdering bodies, and it seemed to draw them toward her. Ryan watched as the lurkers all slowly moved around the fort to the place where she had fallen, even those inside. He bowed his head for a moment, anguished at what he had once again had to do to try and keep the promise to his wife. He had thought he had learned to live with the things he had done, but this moment had brought them all back. Helena's screams were suddenly cut short, and Ryan knew he had to move. Slowly he crept along the wall to the other side of the fort and started climbing down. All the lurkers had moved to where she had fallen, and he remained unseen. Reaching the ground, he quickly moved away, keeping the fort between him and the lurkers. Using a wide arch, Ryan entered Priesca again many hours later. Moving as quickly as his tired body would allow, he searched houses, shops, and any building that he found for supplies and food. He didn't find much, but more than he would have expected so long after society had fallen. He then quickly inspected vehicle after vehicle, but could not get one to run. Cursing his luck, he found a bicycle in the post office and a hand pump in the general store. After inflating the wheels, he started pedaling in the direction of Oopington. He had decided that he would rather sleep next to the road on the ground than spend another night in Priesca. As he reached the edge of town, he slowed to a stop. Slowly he turned and looked at the fort, still standing unaltered atop its copy. It'll probably still be there in a hundred years, Ryan thought. Sighing, his tired body protesting at every move he made, he started pedaling. I have always been fascinated with the unknown, particularly creatures of the unknown. I don't know when this obsession of mine started. It probably started when I was a young kid and would watch documentary series on aliens, Bigfoot, Yeti, unknown sea monsters, and the like. My obsession earned me my share of names and bullying in school. Like a good nerd, I pushed up my glasses and shook it off and moved on to college where I earned degree in zoology and eventually my master's and PhD. Along the way, I had discovered the gym, alcohol, women, contacts, and other things life had to offer. However, my main love was cryptozoology. I spent two years of my late twenties running around the world with well-known and respected biologists, zoologists, marine biologists looking for new species, and studying others that we knew little about. 
My colleagues and myself found new insects, fish, reptiles, but never anything that would fall under the strange or mythical. I made a name for myself in the science community. People liked to say I could find anything but Bigfoot. I enjoyed my small notoriety. After those exciting two years, I decided I wanted to work somewhere more traditional. While creating footprints around the world was fun, I was tired of never being in one place for more than a few weeks at a time. I also wanted to spend more time trying to research and find these storied monsters than work on someone else's expedition. I landed a job at a big state university in Ohio, teaching in the biology department. I also started a cryptozoology club, which attracted a large following of students. With permission from the university, I would take students to so-called haunted places, hotspots for unknown creatures and the like. We would always come up with some crazy disembodied EVP, blurry video, or grainy photo. We never had anything conclusive, but it was fun for the students and myself, and it got them to think outside of the box and question what we really know about our world. The passion for trying to discover the unknown that I saw in the group's members is what kept my interest in it strong. Like I said before, my main love was cryptozoology until one faculty Christmas party. There I met Diane. She was this beautiful brown-haired woman about my age who worked in the English department teaching creative writing. I knew I needed to meet this woman. I wasn't a scrawny nerd from high school anymore. I was in shape, successful in my field, and not too bad looking. At least I told myself that. I used a corny pickup line to introduce myself. She had a cornier comeback. We laughed, talked the entire party, exchanged numbers, and the rest is history. A few months after we started dating, we moved in together. I had never fallen so hard for someone. We shared a lot of common interests, but had a lot of differences. I liked the outdoors, and she preferred to stay in. I was a busy body, and she was more relaxed. We both liked wine and a good book. She was a published writer who wrote these amazing stories about make-believe creatures. I read several of her short stories and one of her books, which all seemed to be centered on forest fairies and children. Diane, I said, closing her latest published book as I was sprawled out on the couch one evening. Have I told you that you are an excellent writer? Diane was in the kitchen making her famous chicken Alfredo. Yes, but you can tell me again if you like, she playfully responded. Can I ask you a question? Where do you get your inspiration for these stories? She walked out of the kitchen, wiping her hands on a dishcloth. I get them from the stories my grandmother told me when I visited her in Canada when I was young. I sat up on the couch and she gracefully took a seat next to me. Tell me more, please, I asked inquisitively. When I was young, Diane began with a look of remembrance on her face. We would visit my grandmother every summer in Alberta. She lived in a town called New Village. There weren't many people there. It was a beautiful town shadowed by snow-capped peaks. There was a great big pine forest that lay between the town and the closest mountain. It was probably a few hundred acres or so. At the base of the mountain was this crystal clear lake that was full of fish and that emptied into a small river. All the kids in town would play in the forest, lake, and river, but were strictly forbidden from staying out past sundown. This was enforced harshly by the townspeople, including my grandmother. Diane paused for a moment. Go on, I urged her with a smile. So, my grandmother would tell me about the fairies in the forest and how they liked to play tricks on people. If I disobeyed my elders, they would take me away forever. Those stories always freaked me out. My parents didn't like her telling me those stories, but they agreed that I should listen to my grandmother and be inside before dark. The stories didn't bother me too much until one of the young boys I played with each summer went missing in the woods. He ran away one night into the forest after a fight with his father. They never found him, and the townspeople didn't bother looking for him till after sunrise. I just can't believe the people wouldn't go looking for a boy in the forest until it was sun up, unless they all truly believed in the fairies. The fairies in my books are mischievous but much nicer than the ones in my grandmother's stories. They never take people away. Diane's face was now a half-smile. Kind of your thing, isn't it? What do you mean? I looked at her slightly confused. 
you know, imaginary creatures that live in the woods. She looked at me with a smart-ass grin. Well, I've heard and read up on fairy folklore, but it's not something that many cryptozoologists spend a vast amount of time on. However, I've never heard of a town afraid of fairies, especially from a first-hand account. It would be interesting to investigate something like that. Diane smiled, a mischievous smile that stretched from ear to ear. Good. My parents want to meet you, and I want you to meet them. My grandmother passed away when I was young, and my parents inherited the house. They retired there a few years ago. You can come with me this summer when I visit them and solve the town's fairy problem. By this point, she was standing over me, giving me the puppy eyes to agree. Just like that, our summer plans were made, and in early June, I found myself on a plane from Ohio to Alberta with Diane and a bag full of some of my recording equipment I took on my excursions with my student group. Once there, we picked up a rental car and drove what felt like hours into the forest-covered mountains. At one point, we left the winding highway to exit onto an even more treacherous two-lane mountain road. Fifteen minutes from the highway, we arrived at what looked like a ghost town. There were several small shops that were closed, and what looked like an unfinished hotel from the 60s. This place has become a ghost town since I was a girl, Diane said, as we drove past the abandoned buildings. A few short minutes later, we pulled into her parents' driveway. Her parents' house sat on a short dead-end road of a few dozen houses. Behind her house lay the thick pine forest she had mentioned to me. In the distant background loomed a majestic snow-capped mountaintop. Her parents greeted us with smiles at the door. Diane excitedly hugged her mother and father. I, trying to hide my nerves meeting my girlfriend's parents for the first time, quickly shook their hands and introduced myself as John, the guy that was here to fix their fairy problem. They both smiled and paused before saying through their teeth, the fair problem is under control. Come in dinner is about ready. My nervous attempt to be funny appeared to have become a strikeout. Dinner went well and we talked about our trip up and what I did at the university. With our bellies full, Diane's father invited me on out to the back porch for a beer. So you teach cryptozoology at the university? Diane's father asked, before taking a big swig of beer from his bottle. No, I teach animal behavior and social interaction. I would like to teach cryptozoology at some point, but I need to have the class curriculum written and approved before I can. I slouched in my porch chair and began to enjoy my beer. I suppose Diane has told you a bunch of crazy stories about fairies in our woods? I looked at him and gave a small nod as I took another sip from my bottle. They're all true. Sounds stupid crazy, but they're all true. My wife told me those stories too, and I wouldn't have believed them if I hadn't seen some crazy stuff or experienced our neighbor's niece disappear one night two summers ago in that pine forest. He pointed towards the wood line just off his backyard while taking another swig from his bottle. We've had a drought the last few years and the pines are all dried up and getting brown. The forest used to be dark and green. Now it's just a sad brownish color. Diane's father finished his beer and looked up at the sky. The pines were brown and looked all dried out, even in the setting sun. The air wasn't filled with that typical pine wood smell. In fact, the air was cool and stale. You want to see a magic trick? He asked me excitedly. Uh, sure. I said, half expecting him to pull a coin out from behind my ear. Watch the back gate. The sun sets at about 9 p.m. today. About that time the latch will pop up and it'll swing open. No hands, he said, waving his in the air. Diane's parents' yard was fenced in with a single back gate, which led directly into the forest. Some of the forest pine's branches hung just over the gate. I wasn't quite sure how to take Diane's father's statement, so I waited. The sun slowly crept behind the mountains, and the clock reached 9 p.m. I finished my beer as we quietly sat on the back porch. As I was about to get up and tell Diane's father that this was the longest trick I'd ever waited for, the sound of scraping against the opposite side of the fence caught my ear. It started at the back corner of the fence. It sounded like a child was dragging a stick across its pickets as they walked by. The sound accelerated towards the gate. I was laser-focused on the gate, paying no attention to Diane and her mother who had walked out on the deck with us. Ching went the gate latch and the gate swung open slowly as if pushed softly by an invisible force. No way, I muttered to myself as I slowly began to walk off the deck towards the back gate. 
A strong, forceful grip pulled me back up on the deck. My head snapped around to see Diane's father gripping my arm with force. Don't go over there, he said in with a stern voice and look. Robert, let him go, Diane's mother chimed in. John, stay here. Do not go anywhere near the woods or the woodline after the sun has set. Mom, Dad, stop. Diane strongly pulled me away from her parents. You're embarrassing me. She turned to me and said, I'll take you into the woods tomorrow. It's fine. You'll see. Come inside. She turned and graciously stormed back into the house. Feeling awkward, I pretended to take one last drink of my beer and began to follow Diane. You can go into the woods all you want during the day, but as soon as the sun sets you must be out, Robert said, cutting me off before I could walk inside. I stopped and looked at him. His face showed genuine concern. I glanced back at Diane's mother. Her face had the same expression. Diane really likes you, John, her mother started. We would prefer if you left with her when your visit here is done. Explore all you want, but please listen to us about the woods. Yes, please listen to Mary and me, Robert said, almost pleading. I looked down. I understand. I'll make sure to heed your warning. I brought some research equipment with me. Is it okay if I place a camera on the fence to capture this tomorrow? That'd be fine, Robert said. Just do it early when it's still light. I agreed. And with that, I went inside, feeling a bit confused at Diane's parents' insistence on staying away from the woods after dark. Diane and I got ready for bed that night, and as I laid in bed with her head on my chest, I tired to piece together if her family really believed in fairies, and if their facial concern earlier was genuine. Your family really believes in the fairies, don't they? I asked Diane. She rolled over and picked up her head to face me. It's embarrassing, not the fact that they believe in that stuff but that they are so adamant that the woods are a bad place. If I had been rebellious as a kid, I would have run off into the woods many times. They are beginning to act like my grandmother when I was a child. I don't know how my dad does that gate trick, but it's getting old. He pulled it on me two years ago and insists it's not him. Diane was getting more annoyed the more she talked. I'll take you into the woods tomorrow. You'll see. I used to play there as a child. There's nothing wrong with it. I pulled her in tight to my body and kissed her goodnight softly. Okay, we'll go have an adventure tomorrow, I said, before dozing off. The next morning, Diane took me into the pine forest after breakfast. She showed me all the things she could remember from her childhood. She showed me her favorite trails, which had become slightly overgrown. She showed me her favorite spot on the river and her favorite shore of the lake. The lakeshore was littered with dead fish here and there, but strangely no rotting fish smell. It's a shame that they died. I remember the lake being healthy when I was young. We used to fish here as kids, she explained to me as we navigated the shores. On the lakeshore was an old foundation to a building that never started. Diane said that it was supposed to be a lodge for visitors to the lake in the 60s, but it was never finished. The crumbling foundation was covered in moss and looked more like a pathetic version of Stonehenge more than anything else. It was about noon and we agreed to head back through the woods to get some lunch at her parents' house. As we walked hand in hand through the woods on trails that I was surprised she could still navigate from her childhood memories. I noticed that almost all of the pines were brown or brownish green. Their trunks were rather large, swollen even, as if stuffed with something, and most of the underbrush was dead or looked like it was dying. Diane mentioned that there had been little rain during the summer and spring of the last few years. I thought it strange that the forest would be dried out, but the river and lake didn't seem to be at low levels. At lunch, Robert brought the topic of cryptozoology and my interests in what they felt were fairies in the forest. You should talk to Daniel Whitefeather. He's a detective with the county and lives a few houses down. He's also the last of tribe that once lived here. He's sort of an amateur historian for the area and has plenty of stories to tell about the fairies in the woods. I'll give him a call and tell him you're coming over. Robert gave me his address, and at the encouragement of Diane, I ventured to his house that afternoon, as Diane and her mother had planned to do some shopping in the next town over. I knocked on Daniel's door, unsure if he would be home or not. The lock unlatched and the door slowly opened to an older man with a weather-beaten face. Are you Daniel? I asked, reaching out my hand for a handshake. My name is Ja, and... You want to know about the woods, correct? He said, cutting me off. Robert called and told me about you. Come in, please. 
I've got a few hours before I need to head to work to cover a night shift. I entered his house. It was large and filled with mounted animals, fish, and a variety of what appeared to be Native American memorabilia. He led me to his living room and motioned for me to sit. His living room walled on all sides by filing cabinets and bookshelves. There was no TV and a thick layer of dust caked most flat surfaces. So what can I tell you? Daniel stated slowly, taking a seat in the chair across from me. Well, whatever you know about the forest or the supposed creatures in the forest, I started. I study unknown creatures, mythological creatures, or whatever you want to call them, and I'm familiar with fairies and folklore, but I've never encountered an entire town that seemed to fear these creatures like they supposedly do here. Daniel sat back for a moment and looked up at the ceiling as if to pull his thoughts down through the tile. My tribe, or rather my ancestors, was the first to settle this area. As the oral tradition goes, we were once a large and proud tribe that numbered greatly in Alberta long before the white settlers came. A harsh run of winters and warring with other tribes cut our numbers down and our enemies pushed us out of our original land. We wandered until we found this place. Cold, starved, and desperate for shelter, we felt blessed to have come across a place with good hunting, the mountains to shelter us, and a river and lake to supply us with fresh water. I looked at him eagerly as he took a small break to remember his words. He sat up and leaned forward in his chair. The story goes that when we found this land, we were forbidden to enter the forest by the some strange creatures that lived there. My people would call them the forest walkers. They said they were guardians of the pine forest here. The chief, seeing his people starving and without a place to live, struck a deal with the forest walkers. We could hunt, fish, live here, and they would protect us as long as once every moon cycle. We agreed to give them one of our own. Wait, I interrupted. So, like a sacrifice? Yes, Daniel continued. Each full moon we would send one chose person by lot into the forest. Their screams would fill the night sky. It was a horrible thing, but for us to survive, the chief made the deal, and we kept to it. Many years would pass as we sacrificed one after another of our own. Our numbers would slowly decrease over time, but those who remained were always safe, had food to hunt, and fresh water to drink. Daniel got up from his seat and walked over to his bookshelf and pulled out a leather-bound book whose page edges were yellowed from age. He plopped the book down in front of me on the coffee table between us. The book landed with a thud, and a dust cloud filled the air. Sorry, I've been busy and haven't had much time to clean, Daniel stated, fighting back a cough and swatting the air to clear it. It's no problem, I calmly replied as I sat back trying to avoid the allergen-heavy mushroom cloud. But how does what appears to be an Indian legend turn into a town of people fearing the woods? That book, he stated, pointing at it, contains all of the stories about the forest walkers that have been passed down from generation to generation in my tribe. I started writing them down when I was young. I got them from the elders, my relatives, and many others before they all passed. I'm the last one, and I figured someone should document this so others can know what we witnessed. Daniel sat back in his chair again now that the dust had settled. Everything changed when the white man came into our land. First it was one man. He was an explorer. We did not see him as a threat, so we let him pass. However, he found gold in the river. He told others. Soon many others showed up looking for gold in the river. They brought furs, meats, beads, and guns. They were willing to trade for small pieces of land so that they could live here while they prospected. We agreed. The prospectors were supplying us with new things, and we were trading small parcels of land for them. The white people cut down trees to make the clearing in which Outtown sits now. They built houses. They hunted and fished. We no longer sent one of our own into the forest every full moon. So the sacrifices stopped because you were getting what you needed from settlers, I questioned. What about your deal with the creatures? We lived peacefully alongside the white man, Daniel started again. The forest walkers were angry that we had broken our deal. They would watch us from the tree line in the shadows. Their anger could be felt. One night, several prospectors who were fishing the lake came home through the forest late. The walkers took one of them violently in front of the others. Their screams filled the night air. The survivors fled and never returned. They left their belongings and even their gold, 
because they were so scared. Soon people who were in the woods past dark began to disappear. No trace could be found. Daniel sat up and took a deep breath. When people started to avoid the woods after dark, they started to trick people into coming into the woods. They would mimic the cries of children or loved ones during the night. Anyone who ran into the woods to save them would be taken. They took three mothers of our tribe once because the walkers cried like babies on the forest line. The women ran to save the babies, only to be taken away. They only took one person at a time, but they started taking them more often as revenge. So they can mimic sounds or voices? I questioned a bit confused. Yes, he began while rubbing the side of his head. They can take anyone's voice or sound like anything that would entice you to enter the woods. The greed of gold was greater than the danger of being taken, and more and more white people showed up until so many had disappeared that the word had gotten out that this land was cursed. Many people left, but those who were widows with small children stayed. Everyone who lives here now is a relative of someone taken. My tribe helped them and welcomed them to stay here. It became forbidden to enter the forest at night. So why are there people still living here? I questioned. Why not pack up a leave this place if it cursed? My people made a pact with those who were left from the prospecting rush. We agreed to guard this place and keep people from the evil here. We would tell no one about this place. We had made a deal and broken it. We had put others in danger. However, no matter what we did or said, the word always made it out about the fishing and hunting or the gold in the river. People would come and disappear. Together we would warn them, but they would disappear in the woods after dark. Once in the sixties, a group found out about the fishing and tried to build a lodge on the lake shore. They are all gone. We tried to warn them, but they called us insane. It is only recently that this town and forest have gone unnoticed by the outside. There have only been a few disappearances in the last ten years. I've seen the foundation. I sat up in the chair as I was drawn into his stories more and more. Daniel got up and walked over to one of his filing cabinets. He pulled open the top drawer, creating another small dust cloud. He reached inside and pulled out a black binder that was stuffed full of paperwork. Here, he said, motioning for me to take the binder. What is this? I questioned, taking the heavy binder from him. It is all the open missing persons cases that I am in charge of. They are all from here. That's crazy, I said as I opened the binder. There must be hundreds of cases in here. Some people say I am a shit detective. I know what happened to those people, but it's not something you can put on an official report and still keep your job. If you look at the reports, they all have the same pattern. These people were all last seen before dark in the forest. I ended my conversation with Daniel, as he was about to get ready for work. He was working a missing person case from two towns over. He let me borrow the case binder and the book of his tribe's stories. That evening I set up a small camera and microphone on the opposite side of the fence in Diane's parents' backyard. If I could get something on tape, I might understand better what I was dealing with. I paired it with my laptop, set it to record, and left the laptop in the bedroom while I got ready for dinner. While sitting on the back deck after dinner, I eagerly read through the stories of his ancestors. The only interruption was the sound of a stick being drug across the fence and the pop of the fence latch coupled with the Robert's voice repeating right on time, as the sun set behind the mountain. I had forgotten about my camera at this point. That night I excitedly discussed with Diane what I had discovered during the afternoon. You should interview the neighbors. Most of them are older and are retired, so they'll be home. I think I'll do that tomorrow, I said excitedly. The idea of having discovered a legitimate cryptozoology find that I could present to the community raced through my mind like a blazing wildfire. Only if you take me to a fancy breakfast in the morning, Diane said with a devilish smile. Mother and I are going to go pick blueberries tomorrow evening to make pie. It's her specialty, and I think you'll like it. Deal. I went to shut off the lights and realized my camera was still recording through my laptop. Diane, let's see if my camera caught what popped open your back gate. Diane slid across the bed as I swiped my fingers across the trackpad to remove the screensaver. The camera screen popped up, and the camera looked like it was facing up at a window on a house rather than down the fence row. That's our bedroom window, Diane said quietly. 
I stood up and walked over to the window. I could see the power light on my camera looking back at me. Something had moved it. No one had touched it since I set it up that I could recall. I hopped back onto my laptop and rewound the captured footage. At 8.57 p.m., the camera started to wiggle, and then it violently drops at an awkward angle to the ground, just as the fence is starting to be scraped. We watched and listened as the gate latched unlocked and the gate swung open. Whatever did it was just off camera. Did you hear that? I asked intensely. What? Diane replied. I bumped the audio level up and skipped back on the video. In a hissing tone, the words no, see, yet sounded. It was quiet but clear. What was that? Diane asked with a quiet, shocked tone. I fast-forwarded through the footage until I saw the camera start to move. From there, an unseen figure picked up the camera and put it on the post where it was now facing our bedroom window. Our bedroom light came on, and in the background of the footage, you could hear a faint giggle like a small child would make. John, that's creeping me out. Diane reached across my lap and shut my laptop. Turn out the light. We're going to bed. She rolled over into bed and pulled the covers over her body. I shut the light off and followed. The next day, after taking Diane to breakfast in the next town over, I went door to door asking people what they knew about the forest. Many were hesitant to talk to me until I explained who I was, what I believed, and that I intended to study what was going on. Once that was out of the way, I was warmly welcomed into many of their homes. The townspeople had a wide array of stories. I wrote down as much as I could in a notebook. Their stories ranged from relatives disappearing to hearing strange voices at night, to seeing groups of travelers go missing in one night without a trace. Many were older stories of loved ones who wandered into the forest late or failed to make it out before sundown. Everyone seemed to believe in the creatures that populated the pine forest, but no one had ever seen one. One older gentleman mentioned his sister had gone into the forest on an afternoon stroll and never returned. For months afterward, he swears he could hear her voice calling every evening to him from the woods, but he dare not enter. Eventually, the voice stopped. The rest of the afternoon I dedicated to taking notes on all of the missing persons' cases. I only stopped to kiss Diane goodbye as she and her mother left to get blueberries from the forest. She had promised to be home in an hour or two. I was fine with her going since it would be several hours before the sun went down. You feel okay going into the woods after the video feed from last night, I questioned. Diane shuddered and then sighed. Nothing bad has ever happened during the day. My mother will be with me. I'm sure it was probably my dad playing a trick on us. Just come home safe to me. She smiled and closed the door. I returned to my reading. Each case had the same set of circumstances. The person was last seen going into the woods before dark or just after dark and not returning once the sun had set. Several of the cases mentioned witnesses hearing strange sounds from the woods. One case in particular mentioned that a county police search group went into the woods after dark. None returned. There was no good explanation of why the people went missing. News clippings placed the blame on people getting lost in the Canadian outback or the possibility of these people running into bears or wolves. Exhausted after all my note-taking, I closed the binder full of cases and sat back in my seat in the living room. I breathed deeply and stood up collecting the binder and book that Daniel had let me borrow. The front door swung open slowly. I looked up, hoping to see Diane and her mother, but to my surprise, Robert walked in. Hey, I didn't even know you were gone, I said in a tired tone. Yeah. Robert started as he took his shoes off at the door. You were buried so deep in your reading that you didn't notice I left for town. Just went out to get some gas for the mower. Yard is getting kind of long and needs to be trimmed. Keep an eye out for Diane and Mary. They went to pick blueberries in the woods and haven't returned yet. Okay, the girls still have time. Sun won't set for another three, three and a half hours. I could hear a slight worry in his voice. I finished gathering my things and walked to Daniel's house to return his items. When I arrived, he was sitting on his front porch, still in his police uniform with a beer. John, he said with a smile, holding the beer up in salutation. I see you've come to return my binder and book. Did you find what you needed? I handed him the book and binder and took a seat beside him. I found a lot of interesting stuff. 
I interviewed many of the neighbors, and I believe everyone feels like there is something in the woods. All the missing cases are similar. All the Indian stories are intriguing, but tell me something. Why are there people still living here? I understand your ancestors made a pact, but why not just up and leave? Daniel put his beer down on the porch and sighed deeply. He raised his hands up and placed them behind his head before sinking back into his chair. This will sound stupid, but it has been an oral tradition and agreement of all those raised here that we would stay and make sure nothing would be built on this land beyond what has already existed. We didn't want other folks to suffer what our ancestors have gone through. Everyone here is a relative of a prospector or settler that came here many years ago. Everyone has lost someone to those woods. All those boarded buildings in town belong to someone here. They've just agreed to never sell them and let them fall into dust. Most people couldn't afford to move away anyway. Some of the houses up the street are the same way. Why give something to someone in the horrid place? We grew up here. We know what it's like to hear the noises in the night and fear for visiting relatives. If the townspeople all die off and this place falls off the map, it'd be best for everyone. He took another deep breath. We are the last of the people who will live here. Diane's parents were raised here. She wasn't. When they are gone, the house will sit abandoned, just like the rest. I sat in silence trying to wrap my head around what Daniel was telling me. Sure, none of the houses in the town were extravagant and no particular person seemed to be wealthy, but how could they live in a place that they all seemed to fear? What do they look like? I asked. Who? Daniel replied, sitting up a little straighter as if surprised by my question. The forest walkers or the fairies or whatever you want to call them. What do they look like? I have no descriptions in any of the text you gave me. The only indication of someone talking to them was your ancestors. I sat up and looked at Daniel with a stern look. Tonight is a full moon. Only a few people have been lost in the woods during the dark in the last ten years. They are angry. You can feel it in the air. I'm going to retire in two years. I spent my life trying to find those missing people. I've been in the woods during the day. They are hard to see. They are tall and very skinny. If you look hard, you can see their outline among the trees. It's very hard to make out, but there are hundreds of them. They are in the woods now. They won't move until dark. But even now you can look among the tree line and see them standing still. Daniel pointed towards the woods that were across the road from his house. I looked hard but could see nothing but pines in the fading light. I thanked him for his time and resources and made my way back to Diane's parents' house in the waning light. The sun had set and a cool breeze blew over the road and into the woods as if the forest itself was inhaling. I walked along the broken sidewalk looking into the dark pines to see if I could catch a glimpse of what Daniel was talking about. The moon was full and extra bright. It almost looked like day out with a slightly bluish tint. There was no noise, no bugs, no birds. Only the breeze and my footsteps filled the night air. I would be home in just another one hundred yards or so. John! A blood-curdling cry sounded from just inside the forest line. That voice. I knew that voice. It was Diane. The hair on my neck stood straight up. My heart began to pound with a violent fervor. Diane hadn't come back with her mother when I left. What if she hadn't made it out of the woods? What if she was hurt? What if she was being taken? John! The scream sounded again. This time it sounded like she was in agonizing pain. I was in the woods twenty yards deep before I realized what I was doing. My eyes scanned everywhere frantically. Diane! I called out. There was no answer, only dead silence. The moon was so bright I could make out almost everything from the light that shone through the pine branches. Diane! I was breathing through my mouth now. My breaths matched the frantic pace of my heart. I stood there in silence. I looked hard at the dense pine forest in front of me. Movement caught my eye. I wasn't alone. There was movement everywhere, but I couldn't see exactly what it was. Whatever it was made no noise and it appeared opaque, almost invisible, as if out of nowhere the opaque shapes melded into reality. They were human height. Their skin was white. They had thin leg, arms, and body structure. Their skin looked dry but ridged like a worm's. Their head was large white sideways cone shape with no features only a small black hole in the front. My muscles tensed as pure fear flowed through me. I couldn't move. I was awestruck and fear consumed at the same time. 
Dozens of these things were in front of me. They all looked horribly the same. I wanted to run. I couldn't. One of them moved slowly towards me. Twenty fafet from me, it stopped. It was dead quiet. My heart was pounding so hard I could hear it. The hole at the front of its head grew larger as if something was pushing out of it. Like the peeling of a sausage casing, the skin of this thing pulled back and out of the black appeared to be a young woman's head. My jaws dropped. I could feel my heart beat in my ears. Her hair was black and greasy looking. Her eyes were black ovals. Her skin was pale. She looked up at me. It felt like an eternity as I looked at this human head upon this monstrosity. Her mouth opened. John, her voice echoed. But I knew that voice. It was Diane's. Confusion took over. The woman head on this monster twisted sideways in horrible manner while looking at me with a blank facial expression. John, 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 Diane's voice repeated faster and faster. Then an ear-shattering, maniacal laugh echoed from its mouth. Tears streaked down my face as my lips began to tremble. It stopped. From jaw to forehead, the woman's face split in half, opening from side to side as if it had been sliced through, revealing a mass of razor-sharp teeth and flailing tentacle-like tongues. The creature shrieked. It was so high-pitched and growling that it made the forest shake and my ears ring. I fell backwards onto my back with a hard thud, and for the first moment since I saw the thing, I could move. I began to shuffle frantically backwards, kicking my legs to propel me away from this monstrosity. The creature dropped to all fours and began to rush me in the most inhuman way possible. I knew there was no way to get up and outrun it in time. It was about to be upon me. I raised my arm to cover my face. No! I shouted as I looked away. Nothing. I felt no pain. No creature landed on me. John, Mom, Dad, no! A cry rang out in Diane's voice, but only this time it sounded as if it came from the direction of her home. I immediately stood up trying to comprehend what was happening. The creatures were gone, but something in the underbrush moved violently away from me, tearing up ground and shaking branches as it went. Mary, no! Another voice rang out. It was Robert's. I was still confused and scared, but I wasn't going to stay in those woods any longer. I ran as fast as my legs could carry me to Diane's parents' house. Robert was in the backyards, restraining Mary, who was sobbing. Let me go, let me go. She's gone, they might take you too, Robert replied, hugging his wife with all his force. What happened? I demanded. Oh my God, John, Robert said as he turned to me in shock. Diane swore she heard you screaming in the woods and ran in after you. We tried to stop her. A scream of pain from Diane rang out in the distance. My fear and adrenaline rush turned to anger. They took the woman I loved. These hideous things took Diane. Without thinking, I ran to the garage and scooped up the gas can Robert had filled earlier in the day. I scanned the garage frantically and found a propane torch on a shelf. I quickly made my way to Treeline in their backyard. Robert, hold this, I commanded as I shoved the propane lighter into his arms. I began pouring the gas carelessly on the trees and the brush along the forest line. What are you doing? He asked with a puzzled look on his face, still trying to comfort his wife. I looked him dead in the eye and cold stated, Give me the torch. If they want to take her, I'm taking the forest from them. He reluctantly handed over the torch I had just forced him to hold. The forest was dry. The breeze was blowing into the forest. I opened the propane valve, lit the torch, and tossed it into the brush. In seconds, there was a towering inferno before me. I grabbed Robert and Mary, who were in shock at what I had just done, and drugged them to the front yard. The fire raged quickly and moved faster than anything I've ever seen before. Soon the entire town was standing on the road, watching the blaze consume the pine forest they had always known. I stood silent among them with rage in my eyes. Suddenly, inhuman screams of horror and pain filled the air. They were piercing like a knife, causing many people to hold their ears. The townsfolk held their ears tight to block out the sound. Many ran back to their homes in fear or gripped each other for comfort. The screams roared deafeningly on and on as the fire raged until suddenly as quickly as it started. The screams went silent and only the blaze could be heard. Someone called the fire department, which alerted the forest rangers. There was nothing they could do. The flames spread so fast that the entire forest was burnt to the ground before they could enact a plan. I admitted to starting the fire and was arrested that night by the county police. I spent three days in jail with little or not human contact. 
The cops moved about the office in a frantic manner, as if they were swamped with more work than they could handle. They ignored me for the better part of my stay there, only feeding me and checking in on me before night. When I awoke in my jail cell the third morning, Daniel was there to greet me. Good morning, I said groggily. He opened the cell. You're free to go, John. What? I was confused and a little shocked. Come with me. He motioned for me to follow him. I stood up and did as he asked. They found Diane. Is she okay? Is she hurt? How? My heart was overjoyed in my confused state. She had some burns, cuts, bruises, suffered from some smoke inhalation, and seems to be in shock, but she's alive. Get in the car and I'll take you to the hospital. I would have told you sooner, but I've been busy with everything that has been going on. Thank God, I shouted. But wait, I'm confused. Why am I going free? Get in the car. I'll tell you about it on the ride over. The car ride to the hospital was about an hour. On our way over, Daniel explained that I was the least of the problems the county had to deal with now. None of the houses in the town were damaged. The wind blew the fire in the opposite direction. Search and rescue teams combing the forest at night and early morning found Diane on the lakeshore. She was nude and in shock but alive. The biggest issue the county had to deal with was the hundreds of skeletons found in the forest. They weren't scattered about like victims of a forest fire would be. The burnt-out pine tree trunks contained dozens of skeletons, as if they had been stuffed into the trees. Daniel showed me a picture on his phone that he had taken at one of the scenes. The photo contained a swollen-looking tree trunk that was burnt out. Inside the trunk you could clearly see a human skeleton contorted in a horrible fashion with the tree growing around it. What looked like wooden veins of bark fused to the skeleton as if they were growing together. Some of the skeletons had been identified by dental record as people who had gone missing in the woods form the 60S. Others were determined to be hundreds of years old. The coroner was now trying to figure out whom the skeletal remains belonged to and how they could have possibly been encased in a tree. Most of my missing person cases will probably be closed because of this, Daniel said, breathing a heavy sigh of relief. I've only slept a few hours the past few days because of all the paperwork I have to do on my missing persons cases. Daniel dropped me off at the hospital and I made my way to Diane's room. Her parents were there. She was bruised and cut up but alive sitting there in her bed, looking forward, jaw agape, not blinking at all. When I walked in, she turned to me slowly, not blinking. When our eyes met, she began to sob. I ran to her and embraced her warmly. They took me, she said through heavy sobbing. They ripped my clothes and tried to put me in there. Where? I asked, fighting off tears of my own while continuing to hug her tightly. In the trees. In the trees, she said through sobs. They feed the forest with us. The forest was dying and it hungered. Not another word was said. I just held her tight till her sobbing stopped. When Diane was released from the hospital, we left for home. Her parents boarded up the house and bought a condo close to where we work. It's been years since this happened. We don't talk about it. Her parents don't talk about it. Yet I'm still obsessed with whatever these things were. With the forest gone, a development company bought all the land that the town sat on cheap and turned it into a housing development. No one has since disappeared to my knowledge in that area. There are some reports that the place is haunted and that at night you can still hear strange voices and screams. My camera had been recording the night of the fire. I watched the video once before I deleted it. Right before Diane was taken, the latch on the gate was popped by something opaque that my camera couldn't make out. The camera is then suddenly turned to the forest. My voice, my voice can be heard calling Diane's name in a scared tone. Diane can be seen running into the forest calling for me. As she disappears beyond what the camera can see, there is a voice that giggles like a small child and then states, we take, in a raspy high voice. The brush all around moves violently towards where Diane was last seen before you can hear her screams. I still run my cryptozoology group at the university and have never come across another story of such creatures. As obsessed as I am at trying to figure out what they were, if I ever came across another place that talked about fairies in the woods, whom take people, I would probably pass on investigating those stories.
A few years ago, I decided I needed a major life change. Everything seemed to be going downhill. My finances, my mental health, my life. I would go weeks without sleeping sometimes as the heavy traffic passed through the city streets down below. Every time I went outside, I saw more homeless people, more needles and crack pipes littering the ground, more muggings and assaults and overdoses and deaths. The city had become a wasteland, and I knew it was time to leave. I had no girlfriend, no wife, no kids. My parents had both died a few years prior, and I barely talked to my siblings anymore. I had nothing to tie me down to this place where I felt like I was dying inside a little more each day. That was when I sold nearly everything I owned, got in my car and drove up to Alaska to try starting anew. I bought a small cabin and a plot of land in the middle of its majestic mountains and dark enchanting forests. In the winter, the northern lights would shine through like the eyes of God, sending out divine trails of light that danced through the sky in cosmic waves. And while the move did help give me some peace of mind, in the end, the source of all my problems had ultimately followed me thousands of miles into this endless wilderness. It would take me a long time to realize the cause of all this misery was myself. Because, as a wise man once said, wherever I go, there I am. I lived in that cabin for three months without any major issues other than the constant threat of bears, moose, and wolves. I had a rifle and a shotgun for hunting, a small garden in the backyard, and a solar panel to generate electricity. This is the life, I said, relaxing on a hammock I had strung across the corner of the cabin while staring at the endless beauty directly outside the window. White-capped mountains loomed like giants in front of thick clusters of evergreens. A virgin covering of fluffy snow made the entire world glisten and sparkle. There wasn't a house or road in sight. No work, no stress, no pollution, no cars honking all the time. I closed my eyes, breathing in the clean air. I ended up falling asleep for a couple hours, waking up just as the sun had started setting. Bright orange streaks mixed with the bloody smears of the fading light as it disappeared behind the mountains. I groggily arose, stumbling over to make a cup of instant coffee. As I sipped it, I wandered around the room, looking for something to pass the time. There were still quite a few random objects left behind by the last owner that I hadn't gotten rid of yet. I had moved in to find a stocked bookshelf filled with classics by Philip K. Dick, Isaac Asimov, and Robert Heinlein. Bored, I started rifling through the collection, looking for something good to pass the time. As I shuffled past a maze of death and ubik, something caught my eye. A black leather-bound book with no title or author name stood there, its cover faded with time and wear. Curious, I pulled it out and opened it. I saw the cursive scrawled across the pages in a neat copperplate script and realized it was a diary left behind by the previous owner. The first entry was dated to January 9, 2015. This is what it said. I don't know if I'm going crazy or not. I went into town to talk to my therapist yesterday and she said I should try writing everything down. She talks to me like it's all in my head, but I know it's not. When I first moved into the cabin, it seemed like paradise. I never thought in a million years that something would be slinking around at night. I never thought it would be hiding under my bed, peeking in windows. My wife claims she hasn't seen or heard anything, but she keeps vanishing on me. Last night she disappeared in the middle of a snowstorm. Where did she go? I asked her in the morning, but she said she was here the whole time. She didn't remember anything. There's no way she went into town. There wasn't time and the trails were impassable that far down. Something's going on here, but I don't know what it is. I'm truly scared for our lives. I slammed the diary shut, not wanting to read any more. I didn't want to become infected by some kind of contagious cabin fever. If the last owner had gone insane in the mountains and started hallucinating naked corpses crawling around, I really didn't want to know. I shoved the diary back in the bookshelf, going for a maze of death instead. I tried to forget what I had read in the diary as I flew through the novella. All night I tried to get the image of the naked twisting man with rotted eyes out of my head, but I couldn't. I eventually fell asleep right before dawn. But as my eyes were closing, I thought I saw a silhouette in the window, a starved man with excited black eyes that seemed to be rotting out of his skull. I thought I saw him put his inhumanly long fingers against the glass as he leaned forward. I blinked, sitting up and glancing out into the white, snow-covered wonderland. There was nothing there. 
Another hunter occasionally followed the deer trails near my cabin. A frozen lake stood a quarter mile away, the surface white and covered in thick drifts of snow. I bundled up, deciding to go outside for a hike in the frigid dawn. I strapped on my snowshoes and grabbed my shotgun as I always did when I went outside. I never knew when a polar bear might be waiting around the next tree after all. I opened the door, seeing footprints pressed into the snow all around my house. At first I thought it was that silhouette I had seen, the nightmarish thing from the diary. But the footprints didn't go over to my window. They followed the trail twenty feet away, veering off towards the frozen lake at the bottom of the hill. I glanced down in that direction, seeing a black figure plodding slowly forward. Steve, I cried, recognizing my only neighbor in a four-mile radius. He had a cabin about a mile away on his own little plot of land. He jumped, clearly startled by the sudden noise. His black snow pants and heavy fur coat swished together as he spun, raising his rifle high. When he saw me, he immediately lowered it and put a gloved hand up in a friendly greeting. Hey, Josh, surprised to see you up this early, he yelled over the muted, wintry landscape. Sounds always seemed different after it snowed, as if all the noise in the world had become faded and dead. Yeah, I've been having a little trouble sleeping, I said, slinging my shotgun around my shoulder. What are you doing anyway? Just a little hunting, you know, he said, giving me a sly wink. Animals are always most active around dusk and dawn, it seems. That's when I always have the best luck anyway. He stepped close to me, staring me in the eyes. You do look like shit. Those bags under your eyes are big enough to carry groceries in. Yeah, trust me, I know. Hey, this might sound a little weird, but did you know the previous owner of this cabin? I asked. Steve's wrinkled old face fell into a scowl. His expression immediately became guarded and distant. Sure, sure we met, he exclaimed bluntly. He seemed to be searching my face for something, but I didn't know what. His reaction left me feeling off balance and nervous. Is he still around, I said. Steve's scowl deepened. Buddy, I don't know what this is about, but he's dead. He's been dead. He died in that cabin, actually. He pointed a finger at my home accusingly. With those words, my heart seemed to drop into my stomach. Waves of dread flowed through my body like water. How, how did he die? Like a heart attack or something, I asked. Steve's gaze turned downwards. He didn't meet my eyes. Do you know that Alaska has the highest missing persons rate in the entire United States? It's not even close. In fact, for the population size, we have far more people who go missing and never get found than anywhere else. They even have a name for it, the Alaska Triangle, Steve said, and we're square in the middle of it. I stared blankly at him, wondering where he was going with this. It seemed like a way to avoid answering my question. No, I didn't know that, I responded. Steve nodded, raising his head again. He heaved a deep sigh. Look, the thing with the last owner and his wife, it's somewhat disturbing. If you really want to know, I'll tell you, but it's certainly not going to help your peace of mind. And it definitely isn't going to help you get some sleep. I want to know, I insisted instantly. The wind started to whip past us. Flakes of ice and snow flew sideways in the sudden currents. Let's go back to your cabin then, Steve said, pulling his heavy fur-lined hood off and shaking out his long black hair behind him. I could use a bit of whiskey to warm up. We sat down with a bottle of Johnny Walker and two shot glasses. I wasn't much of a drinker, but Steve certainly was. He chugged three shots in the span of a minute. I sipped at mine, drinking half and putting it back down on the coffee table with a thunk. Steve grunted, hissing through his open mouth for a moment. Ah, uh, that's the good stuff, he said, slamming his chest as the burning liquor worked its way down. Steve looked up at me with a new sparkle in his eyes. Huh, so you want to know about what happened to Will Lenning? Well, I'll tell you that no one really knows the whole story. I used to see him occasionally, come down and have a drink and talk. We all know each other around here, obviously. I nodded, motioning him on. He seemed like a normal, upstanding guy. He kind of reminded me of you, actually. A young guy trying to escape the hustle and bustle of the city life. The cancer of the American dream. Well, he was here for maybe a couple months, I don't know. Everything seemed fine. We used to go skeet shooting occasionally, have a beer, you know. We'd get together with a couple other hunters who live closer to town and sometimes play some poker. I never saw anything odd about Will. 
I never could have predicted what happened to him. He heaved a long sigh at this, looking out the window at the sharp mountains with an expression of nostalgia. Well, what happened to him? I asked, encouraging him to go on. He started talking about seeing someone peering in through his window at night. He talked about hearing sounds from under his bed while he was laying there in the dark. Sounds like diseased breathing and shuffling. He started keeping all the lights on in his cabin 24 hours a day. Steve leaned close to me. A glimmer of fear rippled across his pale, wrinkled face. He started to lose his mind, started digging holes all over the place, looking for something. Even in the middle of snowstorms, I would occasionally see him outside, digging. It seemed like he never slept anymore. It was classic cabin fever if I ever saw it. It was only a few weeks later that I came over here concerned. I hadn't heard from him in a few days, which was fairly unusual. I found the door hanging wide open, propped up in a chair in the exact spot where you now sit. Will lay with a blast hole showing clear through his skull, a shotgun laying at his feet. And next to him, I found a blood-stained diary open to the middle page. The last entry was stained with blood spatter, but still visible. I remember leaning down and reading it. It was only a few sentences long. I glanced over at the bookshelf with the same diary, saying nothing. It said something like, I see now what's going on. The twisted man is leading me to the truth. Today I will finally find it. And that was his suicide note, I asked, my heart hammering in my chest. He nodded. Yeah, I went into town and got some rangers to come check it out. Eventually they got cops and CSI there. They took all the stuff as evidence, including the diary, he said. Good riddance, I say. Reading something like that is never beneficial. Sometimes delusions spread like a virus, you know what I mean? I did, but I said nothing. I glanced back at the diary, its black leather cover gleaming like a crouching snake, and I wondered, if the police took the diary as evidence, how did it get back here? You said he had a wife living here with him too, I asked. Yeah. She went missing around the same time, he said. Pretty bizarre. The cops thought maybe she just moved away, but... He shook his head grimly. As far as I know, she was never seen again. It was like she had evaporated into thin air. After Steve left, I walked stiffly over to the bookshelf, taking down the diary. I flipped open through the pages. In the middle, I found the last entry. Spatters of old, darkened blood were scattered over the page like raindrops. I found the suicide note and read the date. January 27, 2015, it read. Will Lenning had not lived long after he started seeing the twisted man. I wondered if my fate would be the same. The sun had started to set outside as I sat with the diary at the small, circular kitchen table, eating some stewed venison and rice as I read through the entries. At the end, Will Lenning said the twisted man had been trying to guide him somewhere. That, in fact, the twisted man had been trying to protect him from some great evil, rather than being the source of it. I scoffed, feeling a flash of anger at his stupidity. His naivety obviously led to his death. But then a flash of insight struck me like lightning. What if I was committing the same kind of stupidity? Perhaps I should just grab my gun and valuables and leave. I could take off on the snowmobile and be in town within a couple hours. But in my heart, I knew I would not. Something about the mystery of all this beckoned me to stay. Like a siren leading sailors to destruction, my curiosity called out to me, and I knew I would not be leaving that night. I needed answers, and sadly I would find them. I had fallen asleep with an empty bottle of beer in my hand. I sat in front of the TV, which only got satellite reception. There were, of course, no cable or phone lines threading their way through the forest. All of my power came from stored solar energy. Since I rarely watched TV and really only used it to cook or heat up water for bathing, the energy produced was sufficient even in winter. Tonight, though, I needed its sound, its mindless flashing of light and colors and canned laughter. It seemed to drive away the creeping, suffocating presence like a candle. I woke suddenly. The TV flashed with static. The repetitive hissing of the white noise spit from the speakers like thousands of snakes. I glanced up at the clock. 3.33 a.m. I looked around the dark cabin, confused for a long moment. I didn't understand what had woken me so abruptly. The satellite had never gone out before either, even with the howling winds and freezing hail of the Alaskan winter. 
The TV started flickering as if the static were rising upwards. Black lines traced their way horizontally across the screen. The hissing deepened into a gurgle, and for a second I thought I heard faint words behind the white noise. I thought I heard breathing, slow and diseased, like the death gasp of a drowning man. A black line rose across the TV, and an image came into view. The cabin was suddenly plunged into silence, except for the shrieking wintry wind outside. I leaned close to the screen, confused at what I was looking at. It looked like a live camera feed of a room. As I took in the details, I realized it was my cabin. I saw myself in the chair, leaning close to the screen. I raised my hand, and the miniature version of me on the screen did likewise. Ice water seemed to drip down my spine as waves of dread coursed through my body. What the fuck is this? I whispered, looking back to where the camera should be. It was just a coarse wooden ceiling in that corner. I turned back to the screen and nearly screamed. The TV showed a pale, naked man crouching directly behind my chair now. With jerky movements he rose, his broken spine twisting and shivering. A hissing voice rang out from the speakers. It spoke as if it had dirt and writhing maggots in its throat. He is a killer. The shadow of death, it gurgled. Many have fallen. Many lie buried across this forest. You will be next. He is watching you. Long, broken fingers with blackened nails reached out to touch my shoulders. I jumped out of the chair, stumbling back as I spun around in terror. My back smashed into the TV, and it fell to the floor with a shattering of glass and an explosion of light. In those few moments before the darkness descended on me like a blanket, I thought I glimpsed a pale, sunken face with rotted, blackened eyes peeking out from behind the chair. I turned on every light in the cabin, but there was no sign of the twisted man now. I knew I had to get out of there, though. I thought about the warning that the voice had spoken. If the creature wanted to attack me, then why hadn't it just killed me while I was sleeping? None of it made sense. Who was watching me? The twisted man? And if he was, why warn me? Perhaps it was psychological warfare, I thought to myself. Perhaps the twisted man simply liked to play with his food before he ate it. Thoughts raced through my head at a thousand miles an hour as I threw on snow pants and a couple heavy sweaters and coats. I covered up my entire body as much as I could to try to prevent frostbite. I had made up my mind to flee. There was no snowstorm tonight, though the entire landscape was blanketed in it, and I knew the wind chill would be like an ice blade whipping against my skin. It was extremely dangerous to travel in the middle of the night like this in temperatures that might reach negative thirty degrees. Steve had been right after all. Alaska had the highest missing persons rate of any state, and many of them were never found, their bodies likely frozen solid in the deep snow dozens of miles from the nearest town. I grabbed my shotgun, jumped on my snowmobile, and started heading to Steve's cabin. I hoped I could wait there until the sunrise and then figure out what to do next. But fate would take the decision out of my hands. I felt like there were eyes watching me as I drove along the narrow, winding deer trail. The boughs of the evergreens reached into the path like greedy hands, grabbing at my coat and legs. More than a couple times I thought I saw a pale, naked figure standing in the snow, but it had always gone when I turned to look. I gave a sigh of relief when Steve's place appeared in the distance. I could see the lights twinkling through the small windows of his log cabin. I pulled up next to his door, looking down. I saw two pairs of footprints there, one much smaller than the other. I found it odd, but shrugged it off. The snowmobile cut out with a sucking gurgle. I knocked on the door hard a few times. Steve appeared after a few moments, groggy and half-dressed. He blinked slowly as he looked me up and down. His wrinkled face fell into a frown. Steve, I need a favor, I said quickly. Something weird is happening in my cabin. Can I stay here until morning? Until maybe I can go to town or something? I can't stay at my place tonight. I just can't. He nodded, yawning and motioning me in. You can sleep on the couch, I guess, Steve said. Put that shotgun somewhere safe, though, boy. He had a partitioned bedroom in his cabin. It was significantly larger than my little one-room cabin, though it was basically still just a joint kitchen living room, a small bedroom and a bathroom. He pointed to a well-worn couch in the corner and gave me an apathetic wave as he stumbled back into his bedroom, slamming the door. I couldn't sleep, though. I tiptoed around the room, looking at Steve's bookshelf. He had a rather strange taste in books, 
Lots of Anne Rule and true crime there. I saw dozens of books about Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, Richard Chase, Herbert Mullen, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Richard Ramirez among the collection. At the end, a large black binder stood, unlabeled and worn-looking. It reminded me of the look of that leather-bound diary for a second, and my heart dropped. But logically, I knew this was just a coincidence. Yet, still, I pulled out the binder. My curiosity peaked. What I found inside filled me with dread and horror. Countless news clippings covered the length of it. The first clipping was from nearly twenty years earlier, about a woman who went missing in the Alaskan forest while hiking. A later one confirmed that her body was never found, and that her family was still hoping that she might turn up alive somewhere. A reward was offered for any information, it said. And every page after that was more of the same. Missing woman, murdered prostitute, missing man, no leads. I kept flipping through until I found clippings about Will Lenning's suicide and the sudden disappearance of his wife. On the article about the suicide, Steve had used red marker to scrawl, Ha ha, next to it. I heard the click of a gun being cocked from behind me. I froze as Steve's voice traveled across the room like a whisper. How do you like my work, friend? he asked, his tone jovial and mocking. I still held the binder of horrors tightly in my hands as I stared open-mouthed at this man I thought I knew. It's you? What, you killed Will Lenning and his wife, and a lot of other women, apparently. Everything felt unreal, as if I were stuck in a dream. Steve's grin spread across his face, but his blue eyes stayed cold and dead. Yes, well, she was cheating on him with me anyway. Just another whore, you know. They always get what's coming to them in the end, he hissed, with hatred oozing from his voice. It's too bad, really. I just killed another slut tonight. I was planning on saving you for later. The urge isn't too bad yet right now, after all. It comes in cycles, you see. It comes in waves. I saw a glimmer of pale, naked flesh writhing behind Steve. With jerky movements, the twisted man came up behind him. I said nothing, just watching with wide-eyed horror and amazement. You need help, man, I whispered. Steve laughed. Help? The only help they give people like me is a needle in the arm. You know that. That's why it's important to always cover your tracks. The twisted man ran a long, broken finger across Steve's neck. Steve gave a strangled cry and jumped. He spun around, screaming. I glanced over at my shotgun next to the couch. I jumped for it as Steve turned back to me, firing his pistol twice. The first bullet soared high above me, raining wood splinters down on my head, but the second ripped into my leg. A cold, burning pain ran like fire up my shin. I screamed in agony and battle fury as I gripped the shotgun, spinning and firing. Steve's head exploded as the slug ripped through his brain. His forehead collapsed like a smashed melon as bone splinters and blood sprayed the wall behind him. The twisted man stood there, hunched over, grinning up at me. I felt warm blood gushing from my leg as I stared back at him, breathing hard. I wondered if I was dying. You... you weren't after me at all, were you? I asked. You were after... Steve. But the twisted man said nothing. After a long moment, he slinked back into the shadows of the bedroom and disappeared. As night crawled its way toward morning, I thought back to the words the twisted man had spoken through the TV, suddenly understanding everything. He is a killer, the shadow of death. Many have fallen. Many lie buried across this forest. You will be next. He is watching you. He hadn't been trying to hurt me at all. He had been trying to warn me. He had probably tried to warn Will Lenning and his wife, too. I wrapped my leg in gauze, gritting my teeth. The wound looked puckered and deep, but I could still move my foot and the bullet had gone clean through the flesh. I poured alcohol on it, screaming in pain as it burned its way through my skin. After rummaging through Steve's bathroom, I found some prescription painkillers and swallowed a handful of them with a beer. I knew I would need the opiate high to get through the pain of riding into town with a mutilated leg. As the sun finally rose, I made my way outside the blood-stained floors of the cabin to my snowmobile. Before I left, I glanced back at that horrid place, the scene of so much torment and death. In the open doorway, the twisted man stood, his back hunched, his rotted lips grinning at me, his hand lifted up into the air with jerky movements and waved. I waved back as I started the engine and headed into town. Someone suggested that I share my weird encounter with this group. 
I know fiction is allowed, but I assure you that my encounter is not that. I kind of wish it was just so it would be easier to accept, but that isn't the case. My encounter happened in February of 2007. I used to work third shift at a paper stock factory warehouse. The main day shift supervisor was on vacation, so our boss on night shift decided she wanted to leave early, so she let us sneak off about two hours earlier than our normal shift end time, so this would have been between 4.30 to 5 a.m. I was following a co-worker down this county road as the warehouse was on the outskirts of my small rural town. I noticed he hit his brakes and proceeded to swerve off the road. I'm probably 1,000 behind him and I'm thinking to myself, what the heck is this dude doing? And that's when I saw it. There was a tall, dark shape strolling down the middle of the road in a hunched over and swaying side to side sort of manner. I have likened it to how one of those tall windblower figures you see swaying at a car dealership or something like that moved. Very unnatural movements. I can't do it justice by describing it as it would only really make sense if someone saw it themselves, I feel like. It looked like a tall person wrapped in a large dark blanket or cloak. I had to hit the brakes and swerve too, but I came to a full stop. Whatever it was, I couldn't make out any features or characteristics. I saw a large torso with two legs. The upper half was hunched forward as if it was leaning like an older person would with a walker. Now at that time I was driving a 1998 Ford Explorer, and I've looked up the height of the vehicle and it lists it as around 67. But whatever walked past my driver's window was a good foot or more higher than that, leaning forward. So I believe whatever was walking was over seven tall minimum. Again, I could not see a head, any arms, just a figure with legs walking. My taillights illuminated it as I started to drive past it. I couldn't make out any definite details for the body. I didn't see fur, skin, or anything like clothing. It was solid, not like a translucent type of thing. It was just large, thick, and black, or at the very least dark gray in color. My co-worker had pulled over into a parking lot a little ways down the road, and I followed him in, and you could tell he was scared. He was saying something along the lines of, What was that? It didn't have a head, among a lot of other things most panicked people say. We decided to drive back down and try to see if it's still there, and what it actually is. I drove in front and he was following behind. We come up to the general area and I notice there's a large black animal laying in the middle of the road. It appeared to be a big black dog. Part of me knew this wasn't large enough to be what was walking in the road, but we had to stop because it was directly in the middle of the roadway. I decided to get out and walk up to it, all the while my co-worker is yelling at me to get back in my vehicle. As I approach whatever is laying in the road, it brings its head up and looks back at me. Its eyes are glowing yellow, which I write off as eye shine from the headlights, but it growls at me. So I stop dead in my tracks and just watch. This thing stands up on its back legs like a person but falls back down. It sits back up and hobbles off to the side of the road like a wounded animal that wasn't able to use its front legs. It looked like your typical German Shepherd wolf-type face, but its fur was puffy like a chow dog's. It was a lot bigger than most dogs, but still nowhere as tall as whatever was walking down the road. I didn't see any blood or wounds, so I can't say if it was actually hurt or not. My co-worker got out of the car by this point after it had disappeared into the wood line. We discussed what the heck just happened, but while we were talking, I noticed next to our feet was a mouse. It was just standing there with us, but it was cleaning itself. I nudged it with my shoe and it just kept cleaning its face, as if it wasn't afraid of us. The mouse was sitting in the upright position, as in it was on its hind legs, and using its front paws to wipe itself. I never really considered it until recently that all three of these bizarre happenings was all on two legs. We got back in vehicles and drove off and then the next time at work I had mentioned what happened and our co-workers laughed at us, so the other guy who saw it told me if I don't stop talking about it, he's just going to deny it and I best just forget about it. So for essentially fifteen years I never told anyone up until recently. I have tried to rationalize it into something that makes sense but even then it doesn't completely add up. I have tried to explain it away as it was just a large dog that must have gotten hit by another vehicle before my co-worker and I got there. Maybe it was messing around with the mouse, and it got hit which broke its front legs, so that's why it was trying to use its back legs. The mouse was traumatized from the dog trying to mess with it, 
so it was just standing there cleaning the dog slobber off itself. That sounds at least plausible until the original thing we saw walking without a head. The dog was nowhere as tall as that thing was, so even with the dog standing upright it was close to six foot roughly, but whatever was walking had to have been over seven foot tall as it was so much taller than my explorer, even with it hunched forward. I can explain away the dog and mouse, but I can't just explain what that was, so I'm back at square one trying to understand what it could have possibly be. As someone who's always been very skeptical, it becomes very hard to accept the unacceptable. I have always been interested in weird creatures and such, but I never truly believed they existed. I still struggle to believe that all these crazy stories could be true, and yet, who am I to say they aren't, especially with the weird crap that my former co-worker and I went through that night? All I know is what I saw, but whatever I saw is something I don't know and probably never will. It sounds crazy, and I personally would be hesitant to believe it if someone else told me this happened to them, but that's what happened.